Uh, if you don't want to participate or are not going to participate, that's fine. But it's like you keep the side conversations down so there won't be a distraction. We appreciate it. How's everyone tonight? Good. Okay, so um, I'm not a public speaker. Uh, and I'm not used to like facilitating uh, open discussions or round tables or anything like that. But I'm just going to go ahead and kick it off with, I guess, um, we can start uh, with if you guys can have you any questions for Tribe X. Or have any perspectives you want Sasha, to share? Can you just uh, have this real quick? Start by, um, you know, yeah. raising yeah. hands and we can go from there. I'm just curious how uh, things have been going since the last time we did this a few days ago. Uh, any quick reactions to campus or how you've been treated? I'd love to hear just kind of like updates, things, whatever that was. Awesome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, so sorry about that. If you can go ahead and. Sorry, Brian. I was just curious about um, your experience so far since we last did this on Monday. Um, and what is your take on how the campus has treated you, interacted with you, asked questions or whatever? I'm just curious about that. Okay, so so honestly, I, I, I personally can't say that um, we've had a hard time occupying space here. Um, of course, everybody doesn't. like the fact that we're here but we've also received support from you know faculty and students and stuff like that and people have been bringing a lot of stuff supplies and food and tents and blankets which we appreciate um but of course you know you have people uh who don't like the fact that we're here and have made a shanty town in you guys' courtyard and we have people who don't understand our plight and our concerns and uh, really don't see the significance of our rage and, and that's okay because uh, the, you know the objective for us coming here was to uh, have open dialogue and for people to uh, for it to be okay for people to, to you know say how they feel so does that answer your question anybody else I have good crowd participation. They're passing around. What are your plans for the foreseeable future? I'm sorry, bro. So this is how we're gonna go ahead and do this. So people can raise their hands and then we're just gonna pass the bullhorn around. I believe she was next, ask your question, and then pass it to the next person you see with their hand raised. And feel free to like respond as audience members to each other too. Like it doesn't have to be a QA. Like it's supposed to be dialogue. So you guys can definitely respond to each other's questions. Right, this, this isn't like a us versus you kind of thing. It's kind of like open dialogue, it's like, you know, so. What was your question one more time? What are our plans for the foreseeable future? What are our plans or? Yeah, so as far as Tribex is concerned and the sit-in, uh, we really don't like have a plan for like how long we're gonna be here. Like, okay, well, we occupied space at SLU and we're gonna be there for three days or for a week or whatever the case may be. Um, so. Like I said, the objective was to induce dialogue, share perspectives, and uh, get the opinions of, you know, other intellectuals. And so we've been thinking and talking, and we really don't have anything solid. We're just brainstorming. And we we're hoping that maybe you guys, in addition to, like, sharing your perspectives, could help us uh, come to some conclusions, could help us, uh, you know, think of some solutions, maybe even, like, uh, talk to the administration here and see if SLU could use some of the, the, the power and the leverage that it has here in the city to kind of look, put pressure on the administration of the, of the administra administrators of the metro area to see if we can get some justice. Sorry, this is the question that I always like to answer. So um, there are currently a lot of like student um, run, very informal movements. Um, to continue this discussion once Occupy SLU is over. They're doing a great job creating debate um, and creating dialogue for now, but we intend to continue that hopefully throughout the entire year. Um, so if you're interested in that at all, there are multiple members of the community, like the SLU student community, um, who would be willing to talk to you um, in the audience. Also, I'm one of them. My name is Kat Carroll. Annie is one of them. Um, Libby? as well up there let's see uh maddie 
Maddie runs a blog about this. So um, it's really a matter of finding people that you work well with and hopefully at some points in the near future we'll be able to talk to the administration and have a couple events focused for SLU students. Thanks to these lovely folks who have helped us um, spark all of this debate and spark all of these dialogues that are going on on campus. Um, they are effectively increasing community and um, yeah. and the dialogue and you can actually see Talal in the back picking up cigarette butts. So um, they're not trashing yeah, the okay. campus but they are trying to increase communication which is key. Uh, so like you said like the SLU community uh, there are people who are also passionate about you know uh, the value of black life or lack thereof and there are discussions going on and lecture halls and stuff like that and that's a good thing but i don't want to like i don't want us to like you know marginalize uh stuff and like break off into like uh division and like you know so there's a discussion in a lecture hall and then we're having a discussion out here and then you know the SLU students are talking and then we're talking to ourselves like the in the entire objective of this is so that we could like engage each other and one of the main problems that, that we have, uh, one of the uh, main reasons that we have the problems that we have is that we have people uh, making major calls and making major decisions for us that don't understand us, that don't know us, that mm -hmm. don't, uh, you know, Lack of right really get where we're coming from. And that's, that's, that's the main problem. So don't, uh, don't kind of like, you know, talk amongst each other and not share that like if, if, if there are discussions in lecture halls i think that we should bring the discussions out here in the courtyard cut courtyard so that we can kind of like share those ideas and you know share our input on you know how you feel and then you share your input on how we feel otherwise we're, we're, we're getting nowhere so what you have is a cross-pollination of radical and intellectual cultures here definitely an interesting dynamic <laughs> All right. Um, it's really important to realize that this is like a bigger issue than just like the events that precipitated. <sighs> I think it's about more than just, oh my gosh, about the events um, that precipitated this movement and this occupation of our campus. Um, and I think that's where people are getting hung up and where there's people who are disgruntled and upset. And it's so much bigger than that. And it's about a system that's been broken for hundreds of years. Um, and so realizing that like we're trying to change an entire system um, and so while there's so many different aspects that we have to work on all at the same time but one of the huge ones that's happening in this presence here on campus is these are the people who are going to go out and have different conversations than our parents had and their parents had and like this is the stuff that changes and I know it's frustrating because you're like what do we do right now like right. what do we do 30 seconds from now to make it all better but when you're trying to dismantle an entire system and start over, like this is a huge piece just being here and talking like we are. And so I think sometimes we can get discouraged, but realizing that this isn't as important as trying to push legislation and trying to have leverage in those areas as well. And so, I don't know, for me, like that's what I've been realizing is that this is, this is crucial because this is forming us as people who are gonna pass it on to our children in a decade that's gonna change it one decade at a time, you know? Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, what she said, um, <laughs> so that was a very valid point. Uh, so we do have a lot of people who want to know, like, okay, and then this is a question that keeps coming up. So what's the objective? What are the goals? What are the goals over and over again? What, like, what are you, what's the point? What is the goal? And so people were like, well, what can we do? Can we, you know, what do you guys need? And, and the thing of it is, it's like, this isn't something that you can just like pay for. You know, we need, of course, resources to continue on, but what's more important is solidarity in the movement than you know, solidarity over charity because like, we can't buy liberation. Uh, even, uh, you know, we, so we oppression is not liberation. just one piece. You know, it's not just an economic piece. You, you, got, you, you have uh, a lot of different pieces to oppression. And so, you have affluent black people who are still discriminated against, who live in affluent neighborhoods and, you know, 
are rushed when they are trying to walk to the front door because it seems like, hey, you're breaking into someone's house. So like, as far as like, and then, you know, privileged people are used to results because they're privileged. Something's broken or we need or want something, we fix it or we go and get it. And so it's like, far as far as like what the objective is, the objective is to, or the, the overall goal is to make sure that everyone has e equality and to e economically, but more importantly, make sure that everyone has the equal right to live. Like this isn't about we're poor or we're uneducated or you know we don't like uh, the neighborhood that we live in. This this what we this is about. We can't even walk across the street, walk the quick trip without being shot down. And so that's the first thing that we need to address. And the system didn't get the way that it is, as, as she said, overnight or in 30 minutes. It took 500 years for us to get where we are right now. And so this sit-in isn't going to change the world, but it's going to force us to talk about it, think about it. And uh, when we start talking and thinking, maybe we can come up with some solutions. Hello? What up? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. My name is Josh and I'm a student here at SLU. I am also um, an upper middle class white male and I am a person of privilege. And I've been thinking a lot about like what that means to me. And something that they encourage us to do at SLU is reflect. It is, um, it's an ideal that, um, and please, somebody who's uh, a Jesuit, correct me if I'm wrong, it's a Jesuit ideal reflection as part of that. So that's something that's sort of built into our culture here, or it is strived to be built into our culture here. To reflect so I was reflecting about privilege and my privilege and I was kind of asking myself like why am I here how did I get here at SLU and I think that that's a good question that people like me who are privileged should ask themselves because I didn't get here uh, I mean I got here because I worked hard and was smart but that's not the only reason that I got here I got here because I had a lot of support uh, from friends, family, from my parents. So I think just asking yourself, like, why am I here right now at SLU is a great place for people like me uh, who are privileged, who I'm from West County, like, for people who are privileged to just ask themselves. <laughs> I got a question or something. Can I say something after you? After you. How y'all doing? I know they say it ain't a black and white thing. And it's not. It's just a black thing. It's a black thing. We don't got jobs. We ain't got the education we supposed to have, the same education as a white person supposed to have. We don't get that. Our schools steady getting shut down. We don't have insurance to um, pay for funerals. We don't have money to pay for rent. That's the stuff we going through with my culture, with my city, with my hood, north side, the west side. They not giving us no job. So the best way we know how to get it is the way we gonna go. Because that's the way they put it. These jobs, we go to try to get hired at. McDonald's, they want to give us $7. I can make $7 an hour on my street. Hmm. I can make $20 an hour on my street. Yeah. Bills, 800 You got to pay this and that. That shit hard. That shit hard. We ain't got that paper. We can't get that type of job that y'all get, which y'all going to school for. I can't go to this university. It costs too much. I ain't got nobody to fund me. My family soul ain't got it because we, we worried about paying this bill before we get put out of fucking apartment. We not staying in the house. We don't have enough money to um to take care of a house to do the mortgage. So we stay in an apartment where we still struggle. Do that seems right? That that ain't right. I can't handle the responsibilities of a house. 
So I go to an apartment and I still can't handle these responsibilities. That's a struggle. That's not with the white people, that's with the black people. It ain't no white and black thing. It's not nothing about race. It's just about how much stuff be getting put up on black people. How hard it is out here on these streets. We ain't got no activities in our neighborhood. We don't got no community center. The YMCA charged for us to even come up in there when our family can't even pay that because they gotta pay something else and gotta put money inside the gas tank just to make it back and forth for work. We don't have nothing out here. Y'all, y'all got the opportunity to have an education and go into a high level of life, and y'all are the same as me. Y'all in my generation, we are the same age. And when y'all graduate, y'all need to come back into these cities that don't have nothing and try to improve because y'all know how it is. Y'all see it, but y'all not living. If y'all know y'all can help somebody, help them, help them people. Be the change. Well, that's all I got to say about. It. I don't need a mic. I do want to say something, but I don't need a mic. Well, first I wanted to piggyback off what he was saying. Like a lot of people are, a lot of people ask what white privilege looks like. And it looks like a lot what this gentleman was saying. You know what I mean? We oftentimes don't think about it. It's like, well, we had support and we had family and we got support, you know, emotional or, you know, like in theory, but if we are short paying a bill or we need gas to get to work or school, you know what I mean? Or we need some food. We can't always go ask our families because they do have these same issues. So, you know, they would like to support us idealistically, but like financially with resources, we typically don't have that. And that's an effect of a caste system that was built on top of slavery, which we could be here all night discussing that. You know what I mean? So um, when it doesn't affect you because you have privilege in your life and then you use that as a bubble of isolation to not understand what the struggle is and then you're judgmental about the decisions people make, sometimes they make the best decision that's available to them considering the circumstances that they have, they are in. You know, it's like you got you got, everybody play the hand they got type of deal. You know what I mean? So, I mean, it looks different when you cross cultural lines and then it looks different when you also cross a class line. You know what I mean? So... That's my piggyback on that. But my question going forward is when we think of solutions, are we thinking of solutions to utilize the tools of a system that clearly is not broken because it profits off of this type of institutionalized racism and oppression? Or are we thinking of alternatives that are definitely outside of the box and will challenge the power structure as it is right now? That's a question. I don't mean, I don't know who's gonna answer it, but since we're all out here, you know, Brainstorming, I thought it was a good way to go. I'm going with plan B. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Hannah. Um, I kind of just wanted to talk about privilege for a minute, too. Um, I was just at an open dialogue with my learning community here, and um, we talked a lot about the tension that we've been feeling. And honestly, in my experience with the Occupy Slew movement, I have felt no tension here. Everything has been peaceful and just awesome. The real tension I have noticed is in our student body. And I think that a lot of that comes from the misrepresentation about white privilege. So while I completely understand that I do have white privilege and I will never understand what your struggles are, I think the reason that so many people are struggling with that idea is both that, you know, they don't want to admit that. That's a hard thing to admit, but they're also having a hard time relating to it because we're not also talking about different types of privilege that they may be able to identify with. And so while we want to draw attention to the privileges that we do have and see that other people don't have that, on the flip side of that coin, I think we also need to be focusing on reaching out to people so that they may relate better because until we do, until they say, I can understand in some way what you're going through, that everyone has some sort of pain and depression that they deal with in their lives, I don't think it's sad. <laughs> Many people will, you know, understand or see why we're doing this. So I think that's just a dialogue that we need to open up as well. Yep. Uh, I was going to say, um, uh, I'm a school student as well. 
I'm a SLU student as well. And one thing that I've been hearing a lot in the classrooms, and I went to a conversation earlier today with my learning community, is this idea of why is it always them versus us? Why is it always you people or us people and not really talking about it as one issue? And what I'm going to say is, if you want to, it's your job to make the difference between you and us. If you want to be with them, then you need to be with them. So I'm a SLU student. So I have the privilege of education, right? Like I can come here, I can study, I can hopefully graduate a couple years and get a job. So in the meantime, what do I do with my privileges that I have? It's not something that's made to make you feel guilty. It's something that's made to help you help others. So it's not saying like you versus them. It's saying like you have something that I don't have access to. Are you willing to help me out? Are you willing, like I'm black as well, but I've had certain opportunities and resources that other people don't have. And that might include white people. It's a large majority of black people. But what I'm saying is when you think of you versus us, if you don't like that term, then I would say to take the responsibility yourself to make the division separate. So like she said, she'll never be a black person. That doesn't mean she can't be a black ally. You know, I'm in college, I'm getting a college education. Doesn't mean I can't be an ally to somebody that doesn't have those same resources and help them in ways that I can. And I keep hearing talks about like, basically people feeling guilty for their privilege. So there's all sorts of privileges that we want to talk about, but there's a difference in privileges. So you might talk about like the privilege of being a man, but it's a difference in like gender privilege or uh, your sexual orientation privilege and privilege based off of your skin tone. Exactly. Like there's a, a large difference in those. So I keep hearing like, well, why are we just talking about like black issues or why are we just talking about police brutality? I'm a woman and so I know what it's like to be dealing with male privilege. But I don't see people getting killed, not here, not in America. It happens in other places, but not here because they're a woman. They may have to speak a little louder, ask their presence a little louder, but you have to kind of look at what's more prevalent. I'm not telling you to swallow your own issues, but I'm telling you that it's your job to step outside of yourself and see what you can do to help your own group and those other groups that you may not belong to. I'm also of the opinion that no matter what you are, if you stick black in front of it, it automatically makes it worse. So if you are LGBTQ, but you happen to be black, you have to deal with that struggle. Uh, hi, so these are intersectional. A black I'm issue is and, intersectional. Uh, on this campus. Um, I'm, I'm wondering just in, in terms of throwing ideas out there about how to um, you know, go forward, I hear that there are, are two kind of conflicting ideas going on here. You know, one, the, the, the structural racism is not an economic thing. But then on the other side, there, there is an economic portion to it. So I, I'm just wondering if, first of all, we really need to separate those two. I mean, I think they, they can go hand in hand. Um, but what I'm, what I'm getting at is, I wonder what role just Christian charity can play in this. I mean, I, I think that um, a lot of, I, I know I've learned a lot just through contact with people different from me, and I know that there, there are organizations currently working here in the city to do things that could use a lot of support. I think of uh, Loyola Academy just up the street, uh, a great Jesuit work that would love to have tutors. Um, I think of our parish up in, in North St. Louis, St. Matthews, that could use a lot of help, and not, e not even our work. There are a lot of, uh, you know, clearly there, there are a lot of people trying to do do good here. So I, I wonder uh, how, how far, so there is a question here, I wonder how far do you think uh, just Christian charity can go working through organizations, getting more people uh, out out into service, into the community, how far do you think that can go in breaking down some of these more systemic racial issues? What, um, what type of services specifically are being done? Uh, Loyal, Lo are, are you familiar with Loyola Academy? Yes, so I am. Yeah. So, okay. First, so, what specific services are those? So, what specific sure. services uh, are those? Loyola Academy is a is a work that was started by the Jesuits. It's very close here. It's just two blocks up it's up the road place. by Cardinal Ritter. It's a sixth to eighth grade school. Uh, for low income, you, ha you have to qualify, in order to be in the school, qualify for free or reduced uh, lunch program. It's uh, 20 boys per class. And the idea is to get um, young, young, I mean, it's predominantly black, 
uh, young African Americans boosted up to get into the nice prep schools like SLU High or uh, DeSmet or some of the, some of these other schools. So I mean that's that's just one one thing. I mean I think of Big Brothers Big Sisters. I think of Covenant House, uh, the Bridge. There are a lot of. Can I ask you a question? Sure. What have you done? Uh, I work so every single done? week at social outreach here at College Church, um, 9, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. If anybody's interested, we can always use volunteers. Um, it's a way to, um, the service we provide is do um, IDs and state time? birth certificates for people. I got a question. I have a question about the programs that you're talking The programs that you're talking about are, are located at Jesuit schools? Well, I, I'm just giving examples of some some that are here, and and there's some through campus ministry. Well, no, the reason why I was asking is because like when we talk about issues, especially like in Black communities, like you're talking about what they can do. Um, well, one thing is like a requirement to get these resources, or like be have an open door policy because being a Muslim is very popular in Black communities, and if it's a Jesuit school, and this is like a. a you know what I mean? Like maybe not, it's maybe not said, but it's felt like we're not necessarily welcoming to other religions. Then it's not really welcoming to a large portion of the black community as well. So if you're, if you're asking from my own personal perspective, cause I like to say I'm not a token, but if, from my own personal perspective, that could be something that these charities or these organizations specifically that you're speaking of could do to reach out to these communities. Cause we are, we do need resources and they are available, but there are certain things, obstacles maybe um, that are put in place that make us feel very uncomfortable for crossing those those various lines. Are there any of the programs African American ran was the question if you yes, can't hear it. Yes, the President of Loyola Academy is African American. Um, you said you went to St. Matthews, you said, uh, one of the schools from location? It, it, it's a parish in North St. Louis, yeah. I don't, I think one of the things that you said was, you know, it's like economic status um, prevalent. So I think it's important. Like, for example, if I say I don't have any money, I don't really mean I don't have any money. I mean, for where I am and for what I'm used to having, I don't have a lot of money. So race and economic status play a part because if you look at it, even economically, when a majority white or whatever majority group says that they don't have that, even their poorness is higher than African-American poorness. So white poorness does not compare, white poorness might be here and they still may be struggling. I'm not denying their struggles, but black poorness is here. And that's because of the start that people have. So even if I'm struggling, like I might say it graduate from college and be struggling because I may have loans to pay back. But there are people who haven't had a chance to even get there. And so even though we're both struggling, their struggle doesn't compare to mine. Like they have it a lot, you know what I'm saying? And as far as like organizations in St. Louis, there are great organizations in St. Louis that help and help the cause. But for me, like part of the reason why I joined Tribeca and things is because I wasn't satisfied with the change that I was seeing. I felt like there were things that I wanted to do to see. So I think like often people think like, well, what can I do? What can I join? Think more about what you want to see. And think like, does that organization really represent it? And if it doesn't, I would encourage you to like, maybe start your own organization or start your own thing up. Cause lots of times it's the same groups of people starting up the same programs with the same policies with the same, and we can already see where that's getting us. So I want to do something different and something new. And I would encourage everybody else. I mean, if you're satisfied, that's fine. But if you think you do more, a lot of times you have to be the change you want to see. Exactly. And you have to start it. Be the change. Before we move on, I just like to elaborate on that. And excuse me for you know wanting to elaborate on what she said. And I didn't even and I didn't even hear your, hear your question. But I, I know that you know her answer was talking about uh, economics. I know that. So as I was saying, um, I wanted to elaborate on what she was saying, and excuse me for doing that because I didn't even hear your question. But I heard her say something about you know economics and stuff like that, and does that play a part? And so did you ask a question saying like, hey, is, is, is this an economic thing or something like that? No, no, no. I was I was just saying. Uh, I, I don't I don't know if you necessarily need to separate the two. I mean, I, I think they go together. And economic status is oh, okay. separate issues. Or okay. As, as so, 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 yeah, so, so. I mean, it really wasn't, it wasn't an intellectual question. Yeah. The, the question was about I, just how far you think that if, if we tried to push the, the, the organizations to try to get them 
that, that are already existing, try to get more people involved, if, if that could go... Oh, well, instead of trying to reinvent the wheel, is what he's saying. Like, Which can we one? just use people who are already in play? Academy? Yeah. Ten years. It's, yeah, yeah. So. I, I, I mean, you, you can visit right up here. It, I mean, it's, it's a... So, uh, so this is the thing. There are many pieces to this whole thing of oppression, and the, the, thing, the thing about the demographic of the most oppressed is they're not just, or we're not just oppressed by one piece. As I said earlier, it's not that we're, you know, we're just like uh, we don't have access to education or we don't have access to like resources and money and stuff like that. Not only are we poor and for the most part un uneducated, but we also have like things uh, induced into our neighborhood. We have drug addiction induced into our neighborhood. To kill we have our violence movement. induced into our neighborhood. To kill us. And a lot of people say stuff like about, well, what about black on black crime? Well, you know, <laughs> black on black crime is, 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 is a result of oppression as well because Black on black crime and black on black murder uh, was it, it was induced by gang violence. Violence. Uh, gangs were were a result of the crack epidemic, which was which were, the crack was put into our communities by uh, not some you know big time Colombian drug dealer, but by our government, by uh, President Ronald Reagan and General Oliver North. And so. Um, they wanted to kill the black is so, beautiful, and so, black and proud uh, movement, and they inserted. Economics and, and into our you communities. Know, we have a lot of issues, and these didn't just start on August the 9th. But right now, our primary thing is not that we're poor, not that we want to go to school. Can we walk across the street without being getting our heads blown off by law enforcement who we pay to protect and serve us? That's primary. When we, when we can, you know, realize, or when we can come to the place where we we know that we can, you know, actually have the right to live, then we can get back to them. Can we get some money? Can we get, can we, can we, you know, get admitted into SLU? But right now we just want to, we want our kids to be able to walk the quick trip without being shot down in the street. Well, Kent, that's what I was saying. Like, like you have to, we, we have to break down barriers so, in order um, to get there. You just mentioned black on black crime. And I don't want to, um, I don't want to, uh, yeah, I don't want to disagree, but I do, I disagree on the fact that black on black crime is a myth. And I don't care what, uh, what you've been hearing throughout the media your entire life. Crime happens according to proximity. Okay, black people, yeah, black people do crime on black people because they live around black people. White people do crime on white people because they live around white people, and that statistic never comes up anywhere. But you never, never hear people anywhere. say white people kill no white people all the time. Intraracial crime. So who does crime? Is, is, who does more crime on the other race? You never hear about that either. So like when people talk about black on black crime. That is something used to make us look like animals because they never talk about white on white crime, right. Asian on Asian crime, none of that. Right. Crime happens according to proximity. Do not believe that. That is a made up statistic. So that's what I want to say about that. Every time a young black man is shot and we have internet campaigns about it, the most common argument is, well, black people kill each other all the time. Like, <laughs> what? About the organizations. I'm going to set out some examples. I'm not, I'm the hood person, you hear me? So I ain't going to talk no big words <laughs> if if I had a business and I had say my cousin working there and he doing something I don't like but I'm paying him and he keep on doing it so I'm telling him bye I don't need your services no more and I'm not paying you no money now look at it this way with the organizations that are out here they got stipulations that they have to go by because they getting money funded to them from the government from the federal government probably be from SLU, probably be from Anheuser Bush or something. So if they say the wrong thing or not saying anything about who's funding them, funding the money, but saying um about the Mike Brown incident. They choose a side. Like for the Mike Brown incident, you got me up there trying to support the support Michael Brown and get the police arrest um get the police arrested. I'm up on the organization. They say I can't do that because you're not representing this organization. So you saying I can't support my black brother that got killed by a police officer? They say yes. So you saying as long as you keep getting this money from the federal government 
I'm what you say, you heard me? <laughs> like that that don't make no sense. Y'all gonna keep letting our black babies get killed and y'all just gonna keep collecting this money that y'all say y'all doing it for the community, but y'all see our black brothers keep getting killed. Like if y'all understand where I'm coming from or understand what I'm talking about, I'm saying that they not the organizations that's all that are out here not really doing nothing for our youth because they getting paid from the government. If they say the wrong thing, that check stop roll. Which is so why you have five hundred C three stars. So that's what I gotta say on that part. For charitable, organization, for charitable organizations, he's talking about the 501c3 status, which doesn't allow them to have political uh, dealings, particularly lobbying, I believe. Particularly lobbying. Can you speak up, please, a little? There's stipulations that are sometimes there that. Can y'all hear me? There's, there's stipulations sometimes that uh, stop organ, organizations from being able to maneuver a specific way. And um, I think some of those stipulations play into the, the problem, the entire problem. And one thing that organizations can do if they do have total power over the resources that come into them, I think they can use those for some of the more grassroots organizations that are already existing and let them lead and you just provide resources because a lot of them have great ideas and they're, and they're, they're, they're doing them well in the areas that they are, but they just don't necessarily have the resources. So, And I know that all the big organizations don't always receive uh, their funds from the government. Some of them receive uh, funds from rich people with a lot of money and just want to help. So if they can maybe pad some of those resources that don't come with the stipulations to the grassroots uh, organizations, I think that would be uh, another thing. I'm a Jesuit here on campus too. I was honored to have uh, Ty Vax on my radio show today. We had a really good dialogue. And, uh, <laughs> oh, excuse me, what's your name? Sorry. Alicia. Alicia. Yeah. Alicia, you said a great thing about it's not us versus them. We need to make this a we. Yeah. How do we do this? Um, something I haven't heard yet um, is is how both, both sides need to claim fault too. Right. This isn't just, there is systematic oppression. Um, but if you look at any sort of conflict transformation, to move conflict forward, both parties need to acknowledge that, that something hasn't gone well. They haven't, they, they, both sides haven't taken good action. Um, and it's, I can point to the, the government and we can talk about, you know, police brutality and stop and frisk. Um, but also in terms of like the black community, there's a lot of signs of hope there. So like two things I guess I'd want to talk about, like what's going really well in the black community? Because you're not passive victims in this, you you are competent people who are living and moving and clearly doing a lot. But also, what, what are the signs of, of of ownership to mistakes too? Because I think that those are some, that's what I would love to, to hear. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna slide in and intersect your conversation. First of all, I just want to point out the fact that I'm not sure if you noticed this or not, but this young woman was talking before you kind of overpowered her and spoke, and I think we need oh, to sorry. like be sure those things don't happen when we're talking about race and gender and privilege in spaces like this. But I'll just, and I, I'm intercepting you as well, so I apologize, but I'll just answer this because like, I think I maybe have some perspective that, you know, some of y'all might, you know, benefit from to connect some dots and like, I can't hear you. Do you want to stand up maybe? You, I mean, you, you can connect some. <laughs> Oh, no. Alright, I'll just, just raise my voice. No, it's cool, it's cool. I'll raise my voice. So, like, I kind of want to, like, just connect some dots, starting from, like, what you were saying to what, to what you're saying. So, like, just really quickly, the whole religious piece, I think it's great to ask questions like that, and especially if your interest in social justice or equality is based on your religion, that's a great place to start, and you should definitely view whether it's your college university as an institution or your church and denomination as an institution, as institutions rooted in the same hierarchy and oppression that the police department is rooted in, that the school system is rooted in. You know, so we have to take, the, take those things into consideration. There's great resources there and there's great potential, but what you were saying about making sure that the communities that you want to help are represented or represented and not only represented, but given leadership roles is key to having relevant programming for communities, right? And then, you know, just to, just 
just to sort of, we're, we're all talking about privilege here, and I think that's a nice euphemism sometimes. And, you know, privilege, I think people get the idea when they're talking about privilege that they've been given this place or they've been given, they've been given these opportunities that we didn't necessarily work for. But I'm going to go ahead and take that a, a step further and challenge you to just constantly recognize that they didn't just come out of nowhere. They're built on oppression of others. And so it's not like we're just given these opportunities and that oppression Taking has disappeared, but every opportunity we live and breathe in, on the other flip side of that, is is the bullshit that people have to deal with, is these lack of opportunities, are these fucked up neighborhoods. So we have, that's the dynamic we're working with, right? So it's important to always keep that in mind. And when we're talking about responsibility, it's personal responsibility is great. That's something that we all, we all have as people, we all have power, but we can't, within these conversations, we can't lose sight of the fact that our privilege is built on their oppression. And if you look at the history of black movements in this country, nothing that they've done that has been to address concerns in the community has been enough to get people out of these positions. Mm -hmm. It's not a respectability issue. It's not, it's not claiming fault. You know, we have great community leaders, we have black leaders throughout history that have been hard on their own people, that have built programs to allow their own people to build. The, 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 the reality is it's not enough. It's not enough. And we can't, we can't get around that in any other way. It's not enough. We, we, have to, we have to use our benefits and put them in the hands of these leaders. Like we have to work together and we have to acknowledge things that have been done wrong but essentially the imbalance exists and it's, you know, we have, we have to give what we have to, to try to straighten that out. Cause we got centuries behind us and we got young kids coming up that are gonna deal with the same thing if we're not actively acknowledging that dynamic and actively putting our resources and energy into changing, you know? Like I'm, tell, I'm telling you from the outside, if you, if you don't have connections with leaders or you don't see what people go through, it's very, it's very convenient and it's very hopeful even to think that people can pick themselves up by their bootstraps, right? But it's not, it's not enough, it's not enough. You look at any people that have been able to get themselves out of circumstances, out of colonial circumstances, it wasn't, it wasn't that they just needed to come together and deal with their own problems and address them from a community level. They had to radically change systems that were keeping them in these positions and fueling Fueling, fueling any sort of behavior that you can link someone with in judgment or to say like if you change this behavior we can somehow remedy what's happening you know and we have we have the upper hand we've had it for a long time we still have it so we we are the ones in the position to give people our resources to give people our power to give people our platform they have it they have the ideas they have the solutions you know <laughs> I, I don't remember exactly what your question was, but from what I understood, you were saying that uh, I don't remember exactly what your question was. So let me know if I understood your question correctly. You were saying that we're talking about systematic racism, but that we need to acknowledge fault on both sides. And so what is going well in the black community and then what is not going so well in the black community that we need to change? Yeah, so I was talking about conflict transformation. That there, that what is, what is going well in the black community, signs of hope and signs of struggle within the black community that is not going so well. So we, we talk about gangs and drugs and, and that gentleman talked about it like things you are, your community are dealing with. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I guess that's what, I, that's what I'm curious about. Well, well, I got something to say. 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 I don't see. Yeah, go ahead. So, okay. I think I understand what you're saying. And me being black and me being raised in privilege a little bit, right? Because I have had certain opportunities that my kind of parts haven't. Thank I you, used break to beat. be like really hard on black people. Like, man, why don't we just get up out the hood? Why we can't just go to school and graduate and why we can't wait to have babies until we married and really support our families and why we can't just do better for ourselves. Kind of what she said. Why we can't just pull ourselves up from our bootstraps. It's hard. Right? But then I really thought about it and I took some courses and I got educated. And what I realized is why I asked myself the same questions that I was asking the people I'm looking at. So why can't a group of people bring themselves up? 
what you need would help me was looking at the bigger picture so what makes people not form family what makes people not set the goal of going to college or what makes that an unrealistic goal and that's why i keep going back to systematic racism because what you want to look at is roles in society that's a lot of what systematic racism is about so it's saying that as a black person your role in society does not equate to what another person's role in society is. So like, a lot of my life, I might've been a little token black girl. But why am I a token black girl when a white girl might be doing, we're having the same level of success and that's just normal for her. But for me, I'm a token. That's because of systematic racism. You have to think and constantly remind yourself, and I know we might not want to talk about it, but slavery had a real impact. Okay. It was 300 yeah. years ago. Okay. But, <laughs> the, but, the, but when you think about impact and you think about like past slavery and you think about like segregation, the role, Modern of, day slavery. The role of segregation was really to remind black people of their role in society. It was to let you know that I'm in the front and you in the back. Like you can go after me. I'm gonna drink from this and you don't drink you you can't you can't drink from what i'm drinking from so when you say like oh well what can black people do together it goes back to slavery like black people from day one and i would even say on to today mental slavery is a real thing it's a real thing and that is a big difference a lot of the problems that other races deal with may not be an issue of mental slavery it might be only conditional based and not psychologically based like as a black woman or a black man you might feel like in order to be successful, I need to go play ball, I need to go rap, I need to go sing, I need to go perform. But going to school and becoming what I want to be or owning my own business, those are not options that a lot of black people consider. And that's because of the role of society and how society presents them. You see the Beyonce's, you see you see the Mariah Carey's, maybe even the Oprah Winfrey's, but those are all one in a million. And most of the time, people who are up there are not shown for their intellectual abilities, for their mind, they're shown for their body and what they can physically offer. And if you take a man's mind, you never have to worry about his body. So I hope that that helps answer your question a little bit, because the things that are going well in the black community is that people are trying. You know, people are still aiming. People are still going uh, well. The thing that's going bad in the black community is that people are still in mental enslavement as a result of systematic oppression. People still don't realize their true potential, what they can really do, because of systematic oppression. If you, I, you, I think about my life, if my parents hadn't have been college educated, it wouldn't be a shocker for me not to go and be college educated. That's if my right, mom might have been a prostitute or my dad might have been a drug dealer, like, okay, well, that's not unusual. Like, if everybody around me is dying at 16, like, it might not be unusual for me to die at 16. Like, does that make sense to you guys? Mm -hmm. Like, that's, that's the bigger picture. So that's why it keeps going back to systematic uh, racism. Because black people, are not responsible for the conditions they're in. Society is responsible for the conditions they're in. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't saying you are a result or, or if you just work harder, that's not what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying specifically, geographically, St. Louis, like signs of hope in North St. Louis. Uh, you mentioned Loyal Academy, that's a great sign of hope in North St. Louis. You know, I think of a lot of Bridge of Hope, like these are these are faith communities that are strong. So you're just asking about the good, like what good things are going right now that should keep both good and bad. Like, like, and I don't, I mean, I hear your answer systematically, and that, that's not, that's not your answer. I didn't that's not my question. Are you my question for is, examples of programs that are like functioning and not functioning in the city? Programs that move people forward are great programs for the community. That's the best way I can think to answer your question. So, when you look at Loyola Academy, it's not just aiming to. Um, like there are organizations that you can go to and say, hey, my electric bill is off. Can you give me some money? And they'll cut you a check. But is that going to help me next month to pay my electric bill? Or is Once that going to help year. me like, get my kids through school? Like, So programs that ha actually aim to move <laughs> the whole race or the whole group of people forward so that they don't encounter that same problem again are good programs. And I don't know every program, so I can't name it, but I would say Loyola Academy. If you aim it to educate those young black brothers so they can ultimately go get higher education and hopefully when they make one they bring some people with them that's great and i would say anything like that moving people forward is good anything that's just repetitive like almost like a business like they're not for profit they need people to come to them month after month and ask to pay that bill but that's not helping them like those people are living in struggle while the people in that not for profit are getting their checks so those are the organizations that i say need to reevaluate their system can i piggyback 
I don't know if I was next. I just wanted to, if I, um, okay. <laughs> When talking about the program, like I'm from California, we have a lot of talk about the welfare state there, you know what I mean, and how we take care of our broke people, whatever, but it's not true. And um, the dangerous thing about a lot of these programs, although they seem altruistic, is that at the end of the day, it's appeasement, and it makes us feel comfortable to say, oh, we helped them. Mm -hmm. So what the fuck they talking about? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like they got that already. But the truth of the matter is a lot of these programs are defunded or they're not funded a adequately enough to actually help individuals on the long term. If you pay my PG&E bill this month, that's awesome. But nine times out of 10, these programs only allow that type of assistance once a year. I still got to pay for water, especially in California. So it's like, you know, we have all this. They're talking about you get welfare and, you know, you get Medi-Cal and you get this, that and the other. And so, like, reparations are a joke. You know what I mean? Like if we if we look at it, you look at 9-11 and then you look at pictures of slavery and it's like the one meme is like you see 9-11 and it's like America's like never forget. But then you see slavery and it's like, get the fuck over it. Like, no, we're not over it. We're still not over it. You know what I mean? It's like a system that's been set up. This capitalistic system preys on our appeasement. It says, look, no, we have social programs, but we only got ten thousand dollars a year for this social program. But we have a million one point five million dollars for the police, plus extra militarized equipment. Plus, we have another two point five million dollars every single year to dish out in police misconduct because we don't have the money necessary to train them accordingly so that we can do a redistribution of funds so that we can actually increase and empower the people in these lower socioeconomic communities so they can actually like pour into the system eventually instead of continuously depending on it so it's like when we talk about these programs this is why i'm saying like think outside of the box of outside the structure that already exists it's hard work to think about starting from scratch but like reinventing the wheels kind of what needs to happen because these are programs that exist in a system that oppresses us and they capitalize off of that so even as a 501c3 status these programs that we're talking about there's very little that they can do without losing that status they have to maintain the need if they don't maintain the need then they won't be there so you know like when we like i said when we think about this from another perspective we got to try to find a way to to cover the loophole you know what i mean like if you're really outraged about what's happening grab a tent if you're really outraged about what's happening come together go to the food bank and go out into the community and feed people because these programs aren't going to do that they're going to make you sign a list if you don't have a state id you can't get some access um, resources and things like that so like I'm not saying that they're bad programs. I definitely think we need stuff like that. People need resources, even if it's a little, because every little bit helps. If we all do a little, we can do a lot, you know, but we got to kind of get reform off our brains because reform is how the system has modified to where it is a new Jim Crow. We need to a complete breakdown and restructuring. So that shit is difficult. And that's the reason why we have to have a conversation because we can't break it down without having real alternatives already set in place so that we aren't sitting here without and we have our white allies who once had privilege just as destitute as we are trying to affect change so i mean it's kind of topical to what you were saying but it's just like i'm over here on my own little tangent with my comments in my stream and that's my input right here <laughs> hello hi thank you for watching <laughs> Uh, for a bit. All right. I, I just want to say something about, okay, so, you know, I think yeah. the main issue, yeah. 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 the main issue, I was ready in case, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the police, being able to walk down the street. I want to say something about Southern drugs, um, because uh, that's something that comes up a lot. Um, the bank the problem is not really drugs. Crack is not the problem. The problem is the enforcement of drug laws. So people might use drugs. Actually, if you think about crack, white people use crack more than black people use crack, but black people go to jail for crack, for using crack. And once you go to jail, you get a felony on your record, you can't vote, can't serve on a jury, can't get a job. And so it just serves to, you know, reinforce the oppression that's already there. Um, and, and, and so I think that's a huge problem. I think that sometimes people see you know, drugs as being the problem, but the problem is how we disproportionately um, uh, uh, punish black people for the for the use of drugs 
um, compared to white people. I'm not very eloquent, but uh, my point is that I think we need to, I think one of the things that really needs to change is the criminal justice system and how unfair it is and how it keeps people, you know, where exactly where the system wants them. So that's why. Okay, um, so I wanted to speak to that comment just because this is kind of where my background lies. So like that's what my undergraduate degree is in, is like addiction yeah, studies. Okay. And honestly, like not only, I mean, completely what you said, like truth, but even more so like drug use is a symptom of a bigger problem. Like, why are people using drugs? And it's general like, sources know of dopamine to try to like, fucking oh, get along in this fun. world. Like, no I one, need extra you help to, to do a feel happy. It's fun. Like, Why am I living? You can go and there are people who can recreationally use drugs, whatever that looks like. But when addiction really steps in, like that's a coping behavior for other problems that are happening. And that's what we've been talking about all night, is that this is an entire community of brothers and sisters who are going through so much struggle and trying to find a way to cope with it. Exactly. And when they have no other resources and no other means, then you turn to what's available, honestly. And I mean, maybe you guys can speak to that, but that's what I've seen. And so you look at that as a symptom of a huge problem, and then exploiting that problem with the law enforcement and the way that that is penalized, and then the felonies, and it's this cycle that keeps repeating, because then, oh, I can't get a job, well, I can't succeed, I can't make change, then you're hopeless and you're back where you started. And so I think realizing that so much of this is a feedback loop, and realizing like we've finally got to put ourselves in and interrupt this um, cycle to change something. Talking so. about the war on drugs, um, how people, especially in black community, in black communities, um, it's like marijuana offenses and things like that, could be a sign of them searching for external sources of dopamine to continue to survive in a system that constantly profits off of their oppression. A lot of times, a lot of times, the reason why we have those issues of drug abuse and, and um, alcohol abuse is because they're so prevalent in the neighborhood. I mean, if you don't have to do anything but go around the corner and you see a liquor store, uh, across the street is another liquor store, go up the street is another liquor store. I mean, it's, you walk into having problems, you start at the top of the block and having a problem, by the end of the block, you, you're drunk. You're drunk you forgot about it. You know what I mean? So that, that, that's a, a big issue. And also, um, just like how we have uh, issues in the home and with families, you got Section 8. The woman can be in the home, but the man can't. How, how do you expect us yeah. to have a family if the man can't even be in the home with his family? We'll send the sheriff. We'll send the sheriff to check your closet for clothes. I mean, you can't have. He, no, the man that's can't a be thing. That is a the, real thing. Make, his, his, make sure his family is doing what needs to be done. You know, the school. And you know what happened to me twice? Of. They sent the sheriff to my house looking to see if my baby daddy was living there. On the other side, yeah. you yeah. know. That's crazy. Yeah. But they're heavy was, on our in, in our neighborhoods and with in no our warrant. families. You know, so it, it's it's a big, big issue. That's why we out here, and I appreciate all y'all for coming and keep listening. Any other questions? I'm like, we're not together. He don't live here, but he got some coats and some shoes. Like, you know, what's the problem? All right, so I'm really curious about the That's true, Oakland chick. Every corner on East 14. With your people. <laughs> and I am colorblind. I do not see the color. I see the medical problem. My question is, and I do it down here in St. Louis, um, how do we, so in New Orleans, we were accepted. I never had any issues like I had here. So my question to you is, how, okay, so I'm not colorblind, but it seems like people are coming against me for trying to help you with my wife's privilege as a physician, trying to help you. And today, the reason I'm on my campus is because my daughter was walking to gas and somebody yelled obscenities at her, and that's why I'm here. I want to know how we can help you when you're yelling at us. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, hold on, I see. It. I see. I did want to say one thing, too. Hold on, I'm going to let you speak, too. I, I did want to say one thing. Um, sometimes I, I, it's choice words. Because when you started your, your statement, you said your people. Your people is already making the separation between us. So And that you don't it, see color. Am it, I if invisible? I, it's like if I said your people or, you, I, I'm, you know. Well, and I did that for a reason. I did that because my daughter is wearing a, uh, a Jewish star because we're Jewish. And she was called out as an effing Jew by somebody in her tent. So I'm glad 
Wow, man. By who? Comment on that because I've been here every day since we've been here every hour. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah,
I think, you know, that's a horrible thing to experience. And something that I can understand would be very upsetting. But we also have to understand that the individuals out here organizing are not necessarily responsible for everything that people say that are just passing through. So, you know, like just in terms of accountability and associating people with things, I think these people hold themselves very accountable for their actions and are very organized. And if there's ever an instance where you where you see an individual as part of something, definitely look into it or make sure that they're actually affiliated with an organization because we have a lot of young people out here who a lot of society are already viewing and looking at like they're unprofessional or they are not leaders, whether it's based on their race or it's based on their age or it's based on their clothes or it's based on their zip code or it's based on a combination of the few, of a, multiple things. And one thing, you know, one thing I'll definitely say is that this this movement, what's happening in St. Louis in particular, is very cautious of its inclusivity, and it's also very cautious of making sure that while they're stepping forward in progress, they're bringing other people with them. You know, so there's a lot of presence from the LGBTQ community out here, especially, you know, this weekend. There's a lot of women out here this weekend. They're trying to invite issues of immigration in this weekend. And of course, with every step forward, is also the history of other oppressed people. You know, so that's that's a bad experience, but let's yeah. also be careful and make sure that we're not we're not gonna point fingers at an organization if we don't know. Cause we don't know by walking through somewhere and we don't know because nobody's in a uniform if they're associated with an organization or not. And we don't wanna detract from the work that they're doing out here because you know they're putting themselves out here in an unfamiliar community so that they can reach out to people and have these dialogues, you know? So we don't wanna we don't wanna try to call people out for things if we're not sure if that person is part of that community. But the fact that someone would say that in general shows we have a society where we need work. We need to do work. So it's good that you're out here, you know, because they face the same thing on the street on a daily basis, mm -hmm. you know, and they're getting shot down for it and they're still getting killed for it. So it's good that you're in this space. You know, it's good that you're in this space. It's not good that your daughter experienced that, but it's good that you're in this space, you know? Yeah. Can I? So, I know you can kind of get a question uh, asked. I, there's a couple things I want to say. I don't want to take my time to say them. I know we don't have all night. But first thing I want to say is, like, uh, I just want to say, like, we could back up a little bit, like, off the of people in the front row. Um, and then I was going to ask, I was going to ask the team if we can get someone to uh, part questions because, uh, like, on touchy, touchy uh, topics, like the one we're dealing with now, a lot of people want to have a lot to say on this side and on this side. So if we, can we get someone with a pad and pen to maybe like part questions so, 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 that, so that we could uh, remember when, we, when a lot of people want to speak more for people. Okay. I have like a direct response to her if that's at all possible. Um, I want to apologize. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, hold on. I want to, excuse me, ma'am. I want to apologize for whatever your daughter heard. If it was going to her, if it wasn't going to her, we want to apologize for that. So we don't, we didn't come to this campus to put any harm or negative intention to anybody. Else. Don't nobody know if she's Jews or Christian or we don't know. We are here for another cause. All I know is she is a woman. Okay, so I'm gonna say this. I'm, 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 I'm gonna say this, guys. Um, so I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to censor anybody or cut anybody off or anything like that. But I, I do want to have some structure to, the, to this conversation so that everybody can be heard. And so let's not yell out and stuff like that. Let's kind of take our, our, our take turns and respect whoever is talking. And let's not just like yell out. I, and I know passions are high and stuff like that. That's the point. Let's kind of like be a, a little bit more uh, structured with this. Um, so the first thing that I want to say is this. Uh, so there are five of of us from Tribex out here who organize this action. There are a lot of people who stand in solidarity with us. But as far as like us, the organizers who like are out here all the time, there are five of us. And so um, I think that would that can, that can narrow things down as far as like trying to identify who said that, if that was said. Um, there's also a webcam up there that is being uh, it, it's live on on the World Wide Web. And I'm sure there's there's a DV. Uh, DVR somewhere that if that did happen at 415, uh, I, I challenge uh, who's ever running that up there to pull that DVR up at that time. And you said that she was walking down there and someone right here 
yell that out. So I'm sure that we could zero in on that and figure that out, and it will be dealt with. Um, and if that did happen, if that did happen, ex excuse us. Um, as far as uh, the <clears throat> the yelling that you said, you know, how, we're yelling at you. So this is excuse me. This is the thing. <laughs> so I, I, I've talked with you know a lot of people here at SLU, outside. I've talked in some lecture halls, you know, to, to classes and stuff like that. And that's not the first time that I've heard, you know, that hey, it seems like you're yelling at us, or and people get defensive and stuff like that. But I, I want to say one thing. Understand that um, we are kind of like really frustrated, really passionate about this, and uh, it is. There is some sense of, sense of urgency on our behalf, um, but I don't think that it's like, and we keep saying like, talk about people with privilege, and that's another thing that people are offended by. We're, we're talking about privilege, and we want to talk to people in positions of privilege. Um, white privilege is a thing, and it does have <laughs> power and leverage, and we do want to engage people who do have this, this, this privilege, in hopes that uh, hopefully you know you guys can use it to help us you know since our voices aren't heard and our lives aren't worth anything to make that maybe if you know you with your privilege you can use that to get something done and, and, and help us fix what we're trying to fix um so don't don't be so sensitive about you know us saying well hey we recognize that you have privilege can you use it to help us uh, don't be so sensitive about uh, buzz, buzz terms such as white privilege and uh, and or white supremacy, which is a thing, uh, and which is in fact oppresses even white people who aren't as privileged. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people get offended when we when we start talking about white privilege and use that term white supremacy. But if we don't use the proper language, then we then then we we're, we're kind of like being politically correct, and and PC does nothing but perpetuate the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. <laughs> we, 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 we first need to accept that, you know, a lot of us and a lot of you do have white privilege. I'm just really and if you don't understand that, let's try to understand it and understand what it means. And then let's deal with it. Okay, right. and, and, and as far as like the, 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 the white privilege or, or the white supremacy, a lot of people think that white supremacy means white versus black, black versus white. No, white supremacy is, is White supremacy is, is, is a system that we all live under, and there are multiple pieces to it. There's a racial piece, there's an economic piece, there's a, there's a, there's a gender piece, there's an orientation piece. And so that's, that's what white supremacy means. It's not an attack on you. And uh, what you have to understand is, like, I understand your, your, your frustration and your defensiveness um, about, like, you know, you feel like you're being verbally attacked, and people feel, uh, people get all agitated and uh, frustrated and sensitive about the fact that we fly the flag upside down and stuff like that. But in contrast to what we're talking about, we're talking about our lives. And so, you know, kind of think about that. And, uh, yeah. But as far as that, that, that slur, uh, so I, I don't really see how anybody could, like, identify her as Jewish because as far as, like, when, when I think about Jewish, I think about, you know, uh, first, well, I think about people who have darker, darker hair and, uh, you know, <laughs> look like what the stereotypical Jew looks like. But, but honestly, as far as like uh, a true Jew, and I'm not trying to, be, trying to get off into a, like a history thing, but a true Jew looks like me. Um, and and, and, and oh, a people shit. from Judah. Oh, uh, but we're not going to even go there. Uh, but, but the main point that I want to make is just, if that did really happen at 415, can we get someone to pull that DVR up so that we can confirm that and deal with it? I, I've been, my hand been up for a real long time. Yeah, There's a lot of men been speaking. Y'all just stepping on the women's toes. Like, I've been trying to speak for hella long. I don't, I don't need that, though. Thank you. I, oh, okay. She Did she have her hand up first? It's like, yeah, it's some women in the crowd who've been trying to speak for a minute. Go ahead. She gets 
So as a school student that has been supporting the movement here, I can assure you that anyone, everyone has been very open in trying to be as inclusive as possible. I suggest to you that as a college woman, if something happens to you of that sort, turn around, speak up, even if it's like in this situation or any other situation, because it's not just this movement, it's not just like black and like white and black. A lot of people here at SLU that are sitting here and have been supporting the movement are trying to achieve equality in every aspect of like intersectionality in a person. So if that happens to you again, turn around, speak up to the people who you feel attacked by. And I was here at 450 and I assure you, if it did happen, no one here heard it because I'm pretty sure everyone would have said something. So I'm very happy, it, I'm very sorry it happened to you, but I can assure you nobody here heard it. And we're very sorry, we couldn't like stand up for you. Um, I, I got a couple things. It was shorter, but I had to wait a minute. So now I got some stacked up. But <laughs> <laughs> um, the first thing is, if anybody said anything like that to you, it's completely unacceptable. A lot of the reason why we continue to fight, and I say we because I'm not a part of Tribex. Like I said, I'm not even from here. But as a black woman, the reason why we here is because that's the shit we experience every day. I'm talking about fried chicken, watermelon, all that. Niggers chimp out. Okay, so we don't. That's not what we about. We here because we want to be treated human. So the same way you like, what the fuck? My daughter got the right. I feel that way. And I got a one year old. So when I look at them, they my sons to me. So they got a right. So I trust me, this ain't the space. You know what I mean? Secondarily though, when you stood up, I, I, I from the heart, I understood what you was trying to say. I really do. But can, can I just get you please to stand next yeah, to one of these right. brothers up here real quick. Um, when you see these two standing together, what's the first thing that you notice is a difference? Her, her. Her hair. <laughs> okay, but wait, come on now, come on, let's not be funny. There's a couple things you notice, right? She's a woman, he's a man. She's white, he's black. Are you proud to be black? Yes. Does, does something mean something to you to be black? Yes. So when somebody say they don't see you, is that kind of offensive? Like, I do I do not exist to you? Yeah. So you see what I mean? It's a dangerous statement. So to say I don't see color means that you don't see us, that we are invisible to you, that our struggle means nothing. So I know that it came from a good place. I understand that. And even if it didn't, I'm just going to go on faith that it did. <laughs> but like that type of statement is very dangerous. We need to see each other for who we are and accept that and embrace it because we're all just different humans, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't care if you're purple or yellow. Right. You're a right, right, right. Right. Okay. No, I understand. All right. Well, then for everybody else who thinks that that might be something, I'm not trying to attack you. I don't want, I want this to feel like a safe space to have a conversation. Definitely. Um, the last thing I want to say is what this, this strong woman said here. A lot of our problem is that we are used to putting our heads down and tucking our tails, regardless of what type of oppression or judgments that we face. We all need to start standing up and just have faith that the human beings around me will also stand up. We gotta stop thinking that it's okay. And changing the attitudinal inherency of society does not stop at get out the vote. It do not start at, let me go you know, sit in my sociology class and talk about this theoretically. It starts at, let me push the buttons on the street. I'ma lose a few friends, people gonna defriend me on Facebook and shit, whatever. But that's where it starts at. So when they said that to you, you should have said something. Because if somebody calls me a fucking nigger or a fucking anything else, we gonna have a conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Like that's just gonna be that, you know what I mean? So be strong and be confident because we didn't have to do that in the face of fucking 400 plus years of oppression and slavery. So we need our allies to do that. You can't be an ally if you're not strong and willing to stand for whatever it is that you believe in. As long as, you, as long as you're standing strong with us, we'll stand strong with you. So. Hello, okay. Okay, so um, I just wanna thank Tribex and everybody who's here facilitating these discussions. Um, I've definitely learned a lot in the past couple days, but I do wanna correct the young man that was speaking. It, 
I personally, I, I, I don't know if I'm not Jewish, I, 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 don't, I don't know if he felt this way, but for him to call out the stereotype <laughs> as Jew, for Jews, I know that like his inherent thing, everybody has some <laughs> form of inherent stereotype. And I, and I feel that one of their missions here is to fight the common inherent stereotype, specifically for African American citizens. So I just want to make, I just want to somehow make a point that we can all learn from each other. Because looking at someone, you can't tell, you, you might, you may not be able to tell what their religion is just by looking at them. True. And you, you, we have to be able to break down these stereotypes that we have created in our mind in grouping people together based on our interactions. So, and again, I, like I said, Monday night. It's okay to say the wrong things as long as you are open to changing what you said and correcting any kind of harm that you have done. It's and it's okay to be vulnerable. That's that's my piece. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> be okay. quiet, Black Jack G. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I'm Jewish. If someone says something. I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> if someone called me a fucking Jew, I'm sure I would walk away because I'd be scared. And while I'm sure I would slap myself later and say I should have fought back, I want to acknowledge that when someone encounters a traumatic situation, they don't always um, fight. Sometimes they fly. That's very normal and it's a way to make yourself feel safe. So while I think it's right maybe to fight back if you feel comfortable doing so. I also want to acknowledge that I think it's perfectly okay to leave if you feel that you are saving yourself from harm. So right. that is okay. I got a couple things I want to say. I know y'all know I ain't had this microphone too. But um, I um just got out of incarceration from the penitentiary. Now in the penitentiary you have different games. Now in our culture, the blacks, the blacks don't have no games, just bloods and crips, things like that. And the whites have Pecker Woods, um, Ku Klux Klan, um, and different other organizations. And when you come inside the penitentiary, they're looking at you, the whites, or looking at the other whites to see who gonna pick them up and have them as they road dog. If you don't be their road dog, they beat you up. They make your family send you money to give to them just because you're not rolling with them. So I seen a lot of racism in jail with whites, on whites, because the white person was hanging with a black person. Now, I'm saying this because y'all gonna go through the same thing because mm -hmm. y'all sitting here. Now, some of y'all might say, I'm just sitting here just to hear what they say, or I want to say something to them just because they, they wrong and they're on our campus and they need to leave. Y'all gonna get a lot of people that's gonna stop messing with y'all because y'all messing with black people or y'all supporting the um, incident that happened with Michael Brown and the thing that happened in the Shaw neighborhood. That's one subject, just to let y'all know. The next subject is about this American flag that I'm hearing about. We are talking about the flag that they say that touched these shores, the red, white, and blue flag. But if you look over there on that building, you will see a red flag with a five-pointed green star. That's the Morocco flag. Y'all going to school, y'all got a lot better. Go do y'all history. That was the first flag to touch these shores. We had a treat with them. And we was already on these shores up and down the Mississippi River. Next thing I want to do, what's your nationality? <laughs> it's really random, but that's not my family. What's your nationality? <laughs> I'm uh, Arab. What's your nationality? What's your nationality? You. African-American. You African-American. Y'all see what the education is teaching us? African-American is our nationality? That's not a nationality. That's a label. We went from Negro, Black, color to African-American. What is our nationality? 
do you know who can control the world? Who control the world? It's the world court. All the different leaders from all over the world with different nationalities. You don't see African American. African American be at the bottom of the pot burning because it's not the nationality. We don't know our nationality. We gotta right. learn our nationality. When the young lady said we need to start thinking out the side, thinking outside the box, we need to whatever we learn, unlearn it. Y'all might not comprehend it, but you'll comprehend it late, later. Learn about your history. Learn about these flags. Learn about Morocco. Learn about us. When y'all over, over with this, y'all going back to y'all normal life. And I want to support the mother for coming out here because she heard something happen to her child. Mm -hmm. And she came out here to see what happened to her child. Just like the Michael Brown family, when their child just got killed, murdered by Darren Wilson. She came out there. The whole city came out. The whole world came out. And they exposed a lot of things that are corrupt inside our cities, inside our nations. Who else got a question? Is there any other questions? Do we have any other questions? My name's Clarissa, and I am the president of Social Work Association. Um, and I just want to let you guys know, going off of what's been going here is amazing, and I'm glad to see so many familiar faces after two days of being here. Um, and I want to let you guys know one common thing that kept coming up is the justice system, that it's broken, that we need to fix it. And I am inviting all of you on Friday at 6 to 7, Red and Hudson of the NAACP chapter here in St. Louis, who is a former police officer and a former SLU alum, will be talking about Michael Brown, the criminal justice system, his view as a former cop, and also what the first steps are to changing it. So you are actually going to get some real details about what we can do. So if that's something you're interested in to help these guys out even more, I really invite you to come. It'll be in the Wool Ballrooms, 6 to 7 p.m. on Friday. I need to educate myself more on that before I start discussing it with people, but I think learning about the Moors as black people is something we all definitely need to do. Uh, my stream is asking me about uh, it. My name yeah. is Josh Jones. I, I know. am a master's social work candidate, and I work in the Cross Cultural Center as African American Male Scholars Initiative graduate assistant. And um, in the Cross Cultural Center, in the first week of November, we'll be having an exhibit on race and mass incarceration. So we'll be able to go through and um, learn about various aspects of the, of the issue and how things are out, the privatization of, um, of prisons and the social, the social systems and criminalization of black males and other, and other various issues that are affecting this, this. And then there'll be a panel at the end of that week where you can come and hear from various, various um, staff and members of, of, of the SLU community from African American studies from the law school and that'll, that'll be there and there are people that are educated about these issues so come out and um, learn from the exhibit and, and give and take information from the panel at the end of that week and I believe it's November 1st through November 7th but posters and all that will be coming out here in the next couple of days or by, for sure by next week but um, there, be, look, be on the lookout for that in the CCC what guy DJ what guys who, whose information did you want me to get for you Good evening, everyone. My name is Ari Kimmy. I am a senior here at St. Louis University. I am also the treasurer on the Black Student um, Association. And I just wanted to let you guys know that we're going to be having a panel at the end of the week. And the panel is going to be on the Black Student Board. So I just wanted to comment. I believe someone um, has said that African American is not a um, ethnicity or race, but it is a label. And I personally would just have to respectfully disagree only because my father was born and raised in Nigeria. My mother was born and raised in Sykeston, Missouri, and I identify with my American heritage as well as my Nigerian heritage. Um, but I will further what he said as far as I don't necessarily think that African American is just where I stop at because Africa is a huge continent. And I do feel like people of color who have ancestors who came from slavery in this country need to do themselves a justice by finding out about their history because my Nigerian side of me is something that is beautiful. It's something that I love. My name, Adekimi, is unique. 
people like to say it's ethnic. It's not ethnic. It's just of a different language, the language of Yoruba. And it means even the ground shall worship me. And I will not let anyone call me any short nickname. Even, well, can I just call you Kimmy? No, my name is Ade Kimmy. And so if you are going to identify and say that African American is your ethnicity, do yourself a justice and find out where exactly your history comes from. Do not let it be a label for you. Can I direct respond to that? It's like, uh, okay. Uh, in response to both of those, uh, I kind of agree with them a little bit because uh, I tried to do my history and find out where I came from and I traced my father's last name downhill and it actually goes to a plantation in, in Alabama, but the, the problem is there's three of them down there. And there's no possible way that I could trace back to which Africa. plantation I came from, that my, my my family came from, and then later try to find out maybe what port they bought their slaves from. Like there's so much that goes into that. So I think that what he means by that is not everybody has the privilege of knowing where their father came from or where their mother came from or where their 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 their, their legacy comes from. I that's what I was actually gonna say. Like if you can't afford an Ancestry.com account, you know, if you don't have the money to go get the census records, and if your family was light-skinned enough to pass it off, you know what I'm saying, around sometimes, et cetera, et cetera, we will never have that luxury to know where we came from. Mm -hmm. So it's like, when he said African-American, like I actually agree with both of your, your definitions of the term, but to me, African-American means people that were kidnapped from Africa, and that's all you know about me, is that now I'm, I'm from African and now I'm American. Our president and you, you know, very. There are some people who are in this country who are a different definition, but definitely African American by way. They know where they came. If they're Nigerian or if they're Kenyan, if they were part of a, the Hutu tribe, whatever. You know what I mean? But like our history has been lost upon us, and it's like that's another reason why I feel like we're doomed to repeat another version of slavery within this country, and why we need to revolt and educate ourselves because. We, we can't even learn that history to learn how to effectively combat it because it's been hidden from us from the institutionalized education, which is which has been legitimized by the same oppressive government that we've been talking about fighting against. Okay. You know what I mean? So like while we talk about educating ourselves, yeah, I'm talking about going to school and getting that knowledge, but you have to get it with a certain awareness that that is not the truth that is given to you. And if we accept these labels, then we need to define them individually so that we don't succumb to society's definition of those labels and what's expected of us because of the stereotypes associated with those labels. I love this conversation, y'all, every night. I just love it, I'm sorry. So, so, um, um, I just wanted to say uh, something about it. Uh, would you rebuttal that uh, the term African-American uh, is in fact uh, nationality? Was that, was that your rebuttal? But what it means to people now is different. That's why we need a revolution. It means something different. My mother's American, my father's American. That was the main We talked about that the other night, yeah. And so, um, what I had to say about the, the term African American, and I agree that it, it is not a nationality, and, and this is another case in point of, of privilege, not understanding Someone privileged, night. not understanding the plight of someone not as privileged. So you actually have the privilege of knowing that at least uh, your father is from Nigeria. Uh, so, so you are the child of an immigrant, which which we all are. But the thing of it is, so you are. Of, like, can I say the first generation after an immigrant? So you can say, well, my father was this, my mother was that, and so. And it's okay for you to be able to say, well, you know, I'm African American and Nigerian, but at least you know that you are Nigerian. Like for, for, for the average black person who's labeled as African American, you know, our grandparents, grandparents, grandparents uh, were here, have been here for a long time, and, and we don't know who the hell we are. And that, 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 that was the whole thing behind calling our organization Tribe X, Tribe Unknown. Because we don't, we don't, I don't know if my, if my father my, or my grandfather was from Zimbabwe or from West Africa, East Africa, or where, or wherever the case may be. And so the thing of it is, is so I, you do have a privilege of knowing what your nationality is. And so on the term, side. on one side, and so the, 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 the term African American may not bother you as much because you can identify with your, 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 your culture and your ancestry 
uh, uh, attack it more than than we can. And then, then as far as like a nationality is concerned, uh, nationality, well, like, we're intellectuals here. Uh, let's break the word down. Nationality, nation. we're talking about nations. It, it, the word is like from the word nation. And so, uh, so what am I, we, Enron? We, let me Enron? articulate this. I, I know I stutter in <laughs> stuff like that, but uh, so. <laughs> I was making a joke about American being a corporation. And the term African American does not identify us with an origin or a nation. And uh, it was just a politically correct term that was made up uh, not that long ago uh, to kind of like cushion what they were calling us before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and we're all entitled to our opinions, but I don't identify uh, with being called an, Af an, an African American because uh, as a nationality. Because that's not my nationality. <coughs> that's fine. My point was just saying it's not just a that was right. I'm Moorish American. Well, he said I'm Moorish American. Right there. So uh there you go, DJ. There you go. Y'all to claim y'all nationality. It ain't up for the courts. When they um freed the slaves, it was up for the slaves to claim their nationality. But by them having a lack of knowledge and a information they cling to the names of lincoln williams edwards and things like that all right so that's what we got to we had a couple of people right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. uh why don't you just call yourself american or why or what do you want to be called then we don't know tribal tribe unknown asiatic asiatic black man why not just american but that's not the main issue. The, the main issue is can, the Native American. Before we get to nationality, can we first stop being shot down in the street by indigenous cops? people? White people are shot too. Wait, okay, here, I got it. Right. All right. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that tonight, y'all. I'm not going to touch that tonight. Let me, yeah, let her get that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to touch that tonight, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Professor Dolores Hano at, um, at UNLV, uh, I don't know if she currently works there or is a professor there, um, she wrote that um, when minorities don't associate with the identity as American, American is a label as much as we want to call it as a nationality, whatever, it's, a, it's symbolic, it's a label, it's a word. But it also um, empowers people. So if you identify as American, and if you're white in America and you were born here, you're a U.S. citizen, you likely identify as American. When minorities adjust their labels to where I would say I'm Mexican American, or someone is African American, or someone is uh, whatever else American. It's because that label is simply being American doesn't give us the same empowerment that being an American does to someone who is white. So that helps you by adding that label, creating your own label is a way of creating yourself, an identity for yourself and giving yourself political power so that you can mobilize the movement so that you also are given a voice that is made invisible when people don't recognize your person as an actual American. I mean, I'm told to go back to Africa by, like, I've never been to Africa. Which way do I got we go? Something to say. I don't even know. Here, I got something to say. <laughs> I've never you been know, there. Where you gonna rebut on that? Yeah. I wasn't born yeah, there. And then we'll shoot you. Yeah, he has to get an extra. I know, yeah, yeah. he's right after me. Yeah. Uh, I think, like, calling yourself a, like, Mexican-American, African-American creates racism in itself. What if we all call ourselves American? Then we are all under one umbrella. And then there, there's no, like... If we did, would that stop us from being killed? Would, would that, if we did, would that stop us from being shot down in the street? It wouldn't stop I hope, anybody I hope it from being killed because there are crazy people out there that don't By the respect other humans, just in general, not black people, Mexicans. Yeah, but if you white, white and shoot up a movie theater, then you get captured alive. <laughs> you want, like, that's my thing. Tell me a case where you know a black officer that has, uh, or a history that black officers have repeatedly shot uh, white men. No idea. Or that black men have repeatedly shot up entire movie theaters and schools and been caught alive. And the present history of white officers killing black men and women. That is what we're dealing with. No other race in America deals with that. The 
besides African Americans. Oh no, not just white officers coming out. Renisha McBride, Trayvon Martin. It's not just white officers. It's white people getting away with killing black people. Because if it's black on black crime, which we love to use, y'all take them to jail. Mm -hmm. Okay, go to jail. Because I will say the same. These same problems that we're talking about, we deal with them on a day. We have people that view us as a, as a, as a certain way. Nobody walks up to you and says, hey, you're James Holmes. You know, no, the guy who shot up some Batman movie today? Yeah. Nobody walks up to you every day saying, man, that, that's James Holmes, man. That's James. You, would, you would get pissed off, wouldn't you? you if that was... So, so... If somebody said you your skin you color automatically associates you with be a criminal, to tell me you would not be mad is some bullshit. I speak from experience. <laughs> no, fuck wake up. I wake up crying, holding my baby, apologizing to him because he has my skin because this world would kill him for it. Now tell me that is something that white America does. everyday basis, I'm talking about people's kids looking at them, at you, hearing people say this to you. Little kids hearing this come, how do you think that kid will process that? Has your mother ever woke up in the middle of the night crying to apologize to you about your skin color because she was afraid that somebody would kill you because you was white? Because I, not only me, but a lot of my friends who are mothers, this is shit that happens to us. Just concerned because our kids are black. We scared that one day they're going to get cold and go play outside and not come home. And then lay in the street for four and a half hours and the police not even going to let me hug my baby body while it's still warm for the last time in my life. Like, that's the type of stuff that's a reality in black life. Like, I was just walking down the street like, fuck, I want to go smoke a cigarette, but I'm scared because we black. And then all this racist stuff that I'm seeing on Twitter just because I'm filming it. Like, I'm not I'm not making it as a racist issue. I'm not talking about white people. I'm talking about my struggle as a black person. But because it highlights a lot of the offenses that are committed by white privilege and white supremacy in this society. And I'm making people very uncomfortable because I'm a loud mouth and I like to say shit about it. Like, I'm getting a whole bunch of racist shit. That's not a reality in white life. It's just not. And that's why it's hard for us to say that we're Americans, because honestly, when we brought over, we were not Americans. Uh, after a while, we got programmed to believe that, but now we internalize it, but America still treats us like those little nigger slaves that built the White House now painted white. See what I mean? Like, that's the kind of stuff that we're talking about, that, that, that makes it hard for us to accept the labeling. Do you tell your friends not to treat them like that, or who so don't call them Native Americans, please. They don't like that. They are the indigenous people of this land. Another, another aspect of just sugarcoating everybody in America. Um, not teaching hatred. It's crazy. It, 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 it's not American because you're not accepting the just people that the on the street. Part of the beauty of, of being an American is realizing that nobody is just American. It's the it's the beauty of nine. You're ignoring you're ignoring the culture that 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 I that I relate to, or you're ignoring the culture that somebody else relates to, and that makes me who I am. And and, and when you when I when I'm viewed as just American, you're you're it, that's it's perpetuating that colorblind I, I view that, that that makes things real really difficult because it ignores a lot of a lot of aspects of people that make them who they are. That we cut off all the culture that comes with the, the people that. We proud to be black. That came here. You know, to say we're just Americans. Mm -hmm. That's like cutting off everything. Like an uh, Irish person wouldn't just say I'm I'm an American. They want you to know I'm Irish. There you go. You know what I mean? There we go. Like they gonna speak on it, and that's the same thing. Shit. Okay. This got deep. <laughs> so y'all know it's that oh, right? Okay. So 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 um so uh bro here is facilitating. So as far as like questions, I know we got. He's been waiting for a long know, time and been skipped over. And then I believe she was next. And then I just seen his hand go up. These two. I'm going to start popping questions. So we're going to have two people monitoring stack right now. Talal and Howard are going to be doing stack. How you doing, guys? Hi. My name is Marty. What's up? Hey. So what's going on is, see, I'm from the city. I'm from the south side. And uh, I got to deal with the police pulling me over every day. Searching for my car, asking me if my car is asking me if my uh vehicle is um stolen vehicle, you know. Uh getting whooped by the police. We gotta go through this all the time on the south side. People don't know that in the street it's not about gangs and drugs no more. It's about mm -hmm. the police right. killing the people. That's right. what people don't understand is the police killing the people. And uh talking to Mike. Uh -huh. and uh another thing I gotta mention is that my little brother, his uh he was um uh, 14 years old, 
and uh, the police, he was walking from school, he was going home, he was going home, walking from school, then the police put them over on the police, he was walking. So he got woke by the police, he was bleeding, and then he went to jail, they say um, uh, he had some guns in him, and he just got out of school. So that's why I'm over here every day protesting because of the police, I don't care about the racial thing, and then at the same time it is a racial thing because don't nobody over here know who I am. So nobody know where I'm from. Nothing. Where you from? I'm from Africa. And it's different over there. I'm here sticking up for the black people. Why? Because this is my people too. I'm from Africa. Why? I had to go through a lot of things. I was a, I was, I was a, so, a child soldier. You know, I seen it all. People getting their stomach cut and everything. Babies dying. I seen it all. And then when I came over here, I expected a different life. So they dropped me. You know what I'm saying? They, uh, I came as a refugee camp. They took me on the uh, south side. I was raised on the south side, so I had to deal with every everything with the police and uh, everything. Sometimes I get pulled over. When I get pulled over because I'm black, but once they see my so my uh, driver license, okay, they started asking questions. Okay, so where you from? Okay, first of all, you approach me like, the way you approach me, you um, rush me out of my car. You didn't give me a chance to get my driver license, nothing, guns, you know what I'm saying? You have 10, 15 police car jumping on one person, one black person, Stop 15 sign. police car. You know, yeah. people don't understand that it's, it's real. I'm not even African-American, but I'm African from East Africa, and I got to go through this every day just because I'm black. Right. And they don't know I'm African just because I'm black. Right. And I got to go through this. This is what killed me. Right. And that's why we over here protesting, and people don't understand. It's, it's more going on. I have friends that uh, uh, got killed by the police. I have friends that got shot by the police. I mean, it's, it's, it's just too much, and people in America need to wake up. Like, this is not white and black. This is the people against the police, because the police are killing innocent black people. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's give a little talk about what America can be. As what, for myself to identify as American, how that is different than someone who is a person of color that identifies as American. Now, as an American, I'm going to tell you about my history. I, as a white person from America, brought Africans from their home countries, sundered them from their history, their culture. I brought them here. I gave them my last name. I said they were mine. And then I said, after slavery is over, we're all good. We're all good. You can be Americans now. But American history does not recognize black people. American history says all of these presidents, all of these leaders, everybody that makes a difference, we don't we don't rave about the we don't rave about the slavery. We don't rave about the people in slavery that were trying to fight against slavery. We rave about Abraham Lincoln. Thank God he saved us from slavery. <laughs> He's a vampire hunter too. To white <laughs> so we are talking about American. We are talking about white American. And so to say that that flag means the same thing to black people as to white people is a sham, because we are not recognize their own humanity by doing so. So when you are saying American, we are saying we are colorblind. We are we are making a political statement here that is derogatory, that is demeaning two people that do not all have the same identity as us that do not have the same color skin as us that's all well american american is not just two uh, type of people it's the native american the white and the black we equal it should be everything should be equal but it's not even with the police system you know so let's not forget our indigenous of course yeah. Indigenous. Go back to that. Go indigenous. Up. Indigenous, please. That, that's deep. Indigenous. Thank that's you for please stop say. referring to them as Native American. We cannot. I, can, I can't hear you up here. So, 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 so th 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 this gentleman has to leave, and I want him to have a chance to share his perspective before he he goes. So, if he could please go ahead and say what he has to say, and then we can move forward. All right, I'm Chuck. Um, I appreciate this conversation. This is a deep conversation. You don't hear me? This is a deep conversation. Is that better? Yeah. To talk over here. This is a deep conversation. I appreciate it. When I went to college, they didn't have conversations like this. 
I think earlier you're talking about white privilege for about half an hour, and I wanted to respond because I heard a few comments, um, some I disagree with, some I agree with. Um, I appreciate what everybody here is doing, but most important, I appreciate everybody listening and staying here the whole way. Uh, white privilege is, is somewhat personal to me. Um, I didn't get this. I didn't learn it from book. I didn't read Peggy McIntosh or, or, or Tim Wise or whatever folks read today um, when they learn about white privilege. But I kind of lived it because I grew up. Um, I grew up with money. I grew up with money. Um, you know, not not that rich, but but some money. But by the time I turned 18, my fa I went broke. My father went broke. And the short story is he drank it all the way. But that's a whole other story. But so he drank it all the way, and I found myself broke at 18. And one of the things that bothers me that I hear you know, white folks talk about, and I claim white, by the way, a lot, half, mo, half the people think I'm a, um, a Latino. I got a little bit Mexican in me, but I claim white. And uh, I hear when someone says, I grew up tough, I, I grew up, had a rough childhood, and they talk about economic privilege, and they confuse economic privilege with white privilege. It really annoys me. I'm going to tell you why it annoys me. It annoys me because when I went broke, I went to college, and I went to college for four years. And I never did anything much illegal before college. And actually, that's BS if you throw drugs out there. Much illegal before college or after <laughs> college. But during those times, I shoplifted my ass off. My ass off. And I was good at it. Not proud, but I was good at it. I knew how to have the pockets here. I knew how to put stuff in the pockets. I had a backpack. I walk in with something. Now I went by the cashier with a smile. Because the trick is, you put stuff in the back, and then you're smiling and you buy one or two items, and they took my smile, and they saw I look. See, Daruba can't do this shit that I'm talking about, what mm -hmm. I'm trying to tell you. And I did this for four years, and I never got caught, except once. And one time I got caught, and I got an expert, I had a too small, too expensive rule. That's too expensive, that's too small. That's going in the pocket. And I would do that, and I got by during, and I had a job during this time too, but I wanted some beer money for Thursday nights because it's college, you gotta go on Thursday nights. And you know, <laughs> that real, was really important to me, and I used the money that I made for my job to pay for the rent. And I got away with it, except one time I got caught at Sears. And then I told him, oh, I'm sorry, this is the first time I do it, I didn't do it, I, I apologize, and they caught me on a tape in the, in the store. And I came back and I gave him that whole thing. And I never got a spot on my record, I never got a misdemeanor, I never got anything. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about Michael Brown, oh, he's strong arm robber. He's trying to bring some shit out of the store and just walk away. And his whole character is being assassinated almost to justify his damn death. And we talk about white privilege. You talk about white privilege, you got to talk about all the shit that white folks get away with. And I know it because I live with drug dealers. I live with drug dealers. They're all up my, all up my dorm. They didn't call them drug dealers. They don't even think this sums as drug dealers. And nobody came to bust them. So I have a problem with the personal responsibility discussion. Because I don't hear white people talking to other white people about personal responsibility when they're dealing drugs all over St. Louis University. I know that shit's happening. I know it is. You know it, too. You know who they are. You know how to get it. You know how to get it. Yeah. You know how to get it. Yeah. You know how to get it. And I knew how to get it. I knew who, who I could get drugs from and who I, who I couldn't. So I have a, a serious problem with this personal responsibility discussion. It's not about personal about responsibility. It's about changing a system. And you're benefiting from the system. And just Michael Brown was jaywalking. If you jaywalked, did a cop tell you, get back on the fucking sidewalk? It started there. There's more stop and frisk policy before it got to murder. Right. And if you look at Eric Gardner, who died in New York, before it got to murder, I can't breathe in chokehold, it was why are you selling, selling cigarettes? Selling cigarettes. Like, don't ask what, me for what, 50 what cent. Garner No, said. we died say, for that. You remember what he said? What did he say? He said, it ends today. That was his word. That was his word. He said, it ends today. Like, you're going to stop harassing me, Blue. And his last words were, you know what his last words were? I can't were, right? breathe. I can't breathe. Okay? So it started, you have to look at the whole system of it. The stop and frisk until the death. You can't isolate the death. You have to look at it. They were black. They were treated away from jaywalking up to death. And just because you've done right, and the young man here, and I appreciate your comments, but, but you were saying, well, I didn't do anything. Well, you may not have done anything. That's cool. But it's not about the system. If you have a privilege and you didn't get pulled over and you didn't get shot to death, well, just because you didn't do anything means you might still be alive just because you're a whiteness. Right. Because that could have happened to you if you look different. Right. So even if you're a perfect model citizen, do everything right. Right. If you're not uh, uh, aware of the system and not to, trying to dismantle white privilege by using your white privilege when appropriate then you're not understanding white privilege and and that must be a critical aspect of this discussion and i so appreciate that you're all out here and what we have to do i said white folks we got to bring this to other white folks 
we got to bring us up. Fill this, fill this up every night. Yeah. But we got some education to do. And the last thing I want to say is, it's not about, I heard the guilt word. I hate that word, guilt. It's not about white guilt. White guilt's got nothing to do with it. Don't feel guilty. It's not a good thing. It gives paralysis. It stops you from moving forward. The right word is responsibility. You've been given a privilege. You've been given a gift. You've been given a benefit that's unearned that we don't deserve. So when you have a responsibility to make sure that everybody has the same rights that you have just for justice and equality. And so get that guilt out of your system. Stop talking about it. Let's move forward. Let's get some justice for fucking Mike Brown. Now. You got a Twitter? Hey, do you got a Twitter? I do. What is it? It's at Pop Spot Sports. We do, we do sports and social justice. We shut that Ram shit down the other day. <laughs> <laughs> we had Pop Spot, P-O-P-S-S-P-O-T, sports. We do power, oppression, and privilege in sports. Lost Voices, we're coming to the Cardinals game tomorrow. We have the white folks yelling at us. Why don't you come out with us? Come out with us. Cardinals, 5.30 tomorrow. We're going to be protesting outside because we can't afford the tickets inside. It's playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll let them know. And but let me say this. Yeah, people are going to yell. They're going to be bigoted people. They're going to get be people. In there. Okay, well, I changed what I just said. <laughs> um, but they're going to be bigoted people, and they're going to be indifferent people, and we get that. And they're going to be people who are violent, they're going to yell stuff. But here's what you're also going to get. You're going to get some white people who come up, and they're like, first, they're like, we're like, hands up, don't shoot. And they're like, and then they're like, come on, come on, join us, come on, join us. Sports. And then we had 20 other people at the last protest. Sports. Who felt, sports. Sport, they felt like they got permission to show the justifiable justifiable outrage that you have a lot of white people are looking for permission to say i'm outraged and you're coming up and we saw at the rams game the protest they started joining us and all of a sudden like we're gonna shut it down and it was the first time they protested in their life so yeah it's it beautiful it's beautiful and that's what lost voice has been doing courage is contagious you got to understand yes that. Lost Voices, I came out, I saw them on the ground as Daisha and Cheyenne, you probably know about them, when no one was here, no one was there, I saw them, it was only, only 10 of them, it was only 10 of them, and you know how discouraging it is when you're only 10 and you're going down the street, like, where did everybody go, where did the clergy go, where did uh, the, our elders go, and now it's picking up again, but try doing that when it's only 10, but that courage was contagious, I'm like, I'm riding with them, I'm, I'm uh, uh, getting courageous every second, and we need your courage to get your friend's courage so we can build this movement every day and occupy yeah, the whole damn yeah. San Luis University. You understand what I'm saying? You gotta, you gotta have them deliver it to St. Louis University at the clock tower. Somebody from Tribex will sign for deliveries of food. Chuck Modiano. I, I came from Washington, D.C. It was my third time, 16-hour drives That's each time. Man. And, and, yeah, and, and hey, 16-hour hey, drive. But, but, but I want to let you know, I came with a team from D.C. So we come from a team, and we bring it back home to D.C. We shut down Chinatown. We shut down Georgetown. If anyone's from out of town, bring it back to where you're at. There are Mike Browns in every town. We That's right. That's yeah. right. Our most recent one is named Alan Bluford in Oakland. Alan Bluford. Yeah. So you know, I met his mother. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. She's amazing. She is amazing. She I is. Love her. I love her. Okay. Well, I was also going to address white privilege, and so that's kind of hard to follow up. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had this in my head for about 20 minutes now, ever since um, he was asked how he would feel if someone came up to him and asked him if he was James Bond, and he said I wouldn't mind at all. But I think that's kind of hard to speak to as a white person who's never ever even had that experience to say that I wouldn't mind. Um, so I just kind of wanted to point out white privilege in a different way than was already pointed out by the last person. Um, basically, because there are a few black men who carry guns around, they get profiled and every single black person, therefore, is carrying a gun. Exactly. And that is what the police seem to believe and that is why Mike Brown was shot. Um, but every time you walk into a movie theater and you see a white man walking in, you don't think he's going to pull out a gun and shoot everybody. So, I do. In my opinion, that's a great example <laughs> of white privilege because just because you're walking into a mall doesn't mean everyone thinks you're going to pull out a gun and shoot them. So that's my example of white privilege. I'm real nervous walking down the street. Let's not get it twisted. I want to say something. This is all y'all. Hold on, hold on, hold on, bro. Bro, you can't. We, we, we got, we got, we got. You, 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 you have to. All right, I'm following the road. <laughs> Okay, um, this has to do with something that was said a while back, and this has come up on both sides of the argument, and it's something that just really gets me. I understand that these people dying is what kind of started all of this and gave us permission, but I think we need to remember that these were individuals who died. They weren't around for them to die so then we could 
Kickstarter protests and talk about them. Right. I have, there was someone from my hometown who was killed due to police brutality. He happened to be another white individual and no one, no one, he's forgotten already. And it happened a month ago. He's already forgotten. And I don't want that to happen to the individuals whose lives were taken. But I, we do need to remember that these are individuals. And I think we're generalizing them and putting them all together. When in reality, they were all different people too. Just like me and the kid from my hometown, we're completely different people. And I guess I have a problem when we're going back and forth and debating, when we're discussing, I can't remember, it was like a while back, and someone's response was, oh, well, are you gonna get shot or something about getting shot? That's not gonna further this dialogue or education to immediately go to such an extreme. So I think as we like further talk and discuss, we need to keep in mind what we're trying to answer and also what we're asking. And I, with in regards to the hands up, don't shoot, I understand why it's a slogan and why it's a part of it. But as someone who knows a police officer personally, who's its family friend, I think there, a huge stereotype has now been put on our police officers who serve a duty to us. I worked for a defense attorney all summer, and so we had to deal with a lot of police officers. And you guys don't see the back work they have to do. Just like a small group of people can be labeled, a, a small, very small group of police officers are now being labeled, and you're saying all police officers are after black people, or they think everyone has guns, which is not the case. So I think we need to keep in mind how we're labeling from each side, and that individuals that have passed away because of police misconduct need to be remembered as the individuals they were and not catalysts for us to protest. And I think it's great that they inspire this discussion, but at this point, I think we need to remember this is about changing the system. A part of that is racism and how the police treat certain groups of people, but the larger picture is changing the system. Not, I guess, I guess I'm very uncomfortable with the, the hands up, don't shoot, because to police officers who have they who aren't getting paid very well who served their time five who have figure a salaries in Oakland Police Department them and almost killed themselves That's then don't very, be very a police impressive. officer so I think we need to be careful on both sides of not labeling and remember the the individuals that are gone now but as individuals they were and not as names that could start a protest well all I know is if we on a police line and there are kids in the crowd your good police officer will still shoot tear gas and that shit and rubber bullets and if there are veterans like Scott Olsen he'll get cracked in his head to where he has brain damage so I don't really give a shit about all of that y'all fucking are bastards you will hurt us because you are a robot and will take orders and not be human if you want to save a life be a fucking fireman I was gonna say, if you scared to get I shot, mean, don't be a police officer. If you don't know how to not instigate the situation, the don't be a police thing. officer. But and you know, police feel like they're being targeted, or you know, they feel like they got you know, guns and fucking Kevlar. Them. So what if you? And are? I, can I got a T-shirt. Probably agree, but that's exactly how what happens to people in our community. You know, and that's the point. You know, we are need to be uncomfortable. Exactly. Called hoodlums or, or, or whatever. Monkeys. That, you know, chimp and, and out. A couple animals. may have said that. Animals. You know, oh, come on, they're saying it right now. I'm but, reading it. You know, yeah, right. Things like that, right. that is being said. But how, it, it, it's like, what's the only way that you can understand how we feel if it's not somewhat the same thing done to you? You know what I mean? Like, understanding so without, think... without, hold on, without any type of violent action. Because it's, it's not, the hands up, don't shoot isn't directed to any specific person. Like monkey, like gremlin, like, you know, you're directing a, a, a word, a term to a person. You know, you're not, you're, this statement is not a word. You know what I mean? I do think it's a statement directed towards a police officer. I don't know who else would have done that. Right, who else is shooting an armed black man? And furthering kind of like what you said, with what you're saying is like we can't I agree like I don't I have no idea what it'd been like to been oppressed for this many years my family had to deal with discrimination when we first came to this country but now it's gone for my family but I know for others that it still exists but I don't think the way to further 
our education and change the system. It's okay. It's it's okay. Just, relax. Sorry. It's okay. I look, get nervous. Look, 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 it's okay. Look, we all out here. Just, just relax. Okay. I just don't think the way to do it is when I don't. It's kind of boiled down to because she's about to go and I'm gonna make her cry. So even though people were oppressed, I don't think the goal of this should be to show those white people what oppression feels like. Because Why? I don't think that. That's gonna it's gonna make you life. uncomfortable and know our life. No, it's gonna, oh, it's, it's so gonna horrible to us. feel like us. You're like, wrong. why learn? Shut anything. up. What is wrong for well, you to understand how we feel? All right, excuse. Yeah. All right, I'm a, okay. They got me. They got me. They got me. I, okay, right. I don't need no white man telling me shit. Sorry, excuse me. Straight up. All right, well, they got me right here. I'm done. I, and, and hey, hey, hold on, hold on, bro, 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 bro please, where are you going? Please, please don't go. Where, where are you going? Hold on, but, but, hold on, but hold on, take this Hold on. I don't fucking need nobody telling me what to do. Now, you see how you walking away now? It was a, it was a gentleman that had walked through, uh, that had started talking and cut a young lady off when she was talking down here. That was a sister, but no one said anything then. So, so, right, so now all of a sudden, you, you let me shut up. Like I said, okay. let me I cry. Don't want to make people cry and get mad. I'm right, quiet. but but we have to build. That is something to build on. When people walk away, how can you build from something that you just drop it? Right, but I, I do I do want to say this, and Bella is with us, and we do have her, as she said. But at the same time, I do want to say that we're not going to be biased and allow people to, uh, because this is supposed to be a space where it's okay for everybody to say how, how they feel. Yeah, it's correct. Right. Let, let, let's not try to intimidate each other and talk down on each other, in regards to how high your passion is. Let's kind of like let, make, if you want people to, to feel comfortable saying what they have to True. say, so let's not, let's not do that. Now, let's let's, let her I, I just want to give one quick statement to her, because mm -hmm. uh, uh, no, I, I ain't going to be lying, I'm going to let you finish. Okay. I'm sorry yeah. for interrupting, yeah, yeah. but like, okay, you said something about we, uh, like, okay, you said something about oppression, and to touch on what you said on oppression, I can't directly quote you, but to touch on what you said, we're not, we're not bringing the story of our oppression on y'all to oppress you guys. We bring in the story of our oppression on you all so you can see where we are coming from and you can't just say, oh, I don't know why you guys are feeling like that or why you guys are doing that. Or I don't want to have a conversation because it no, makes me uncomfortable. I understand that. And I think that as someone who doesn't come from a long line of oppression, I need to realize that I'm never and I will never be able to understand that. However, I don't think trying to oppress any group of people is going to further our movement to change our system. It yeah. can make us understand to an extent, but as you said, it's never going to make us understand fully. Yeah. So I think instead of trying to oppress each other or try to say, I'm going to try to make you understand or I'm going to try to make you understand where I'm coming from, we need to together collectively go to the lawmakers, go to the judges, go to the senators who make the big, bigger systematic changes. And that's where face. this dialogue needs to lead to. Can I ask you a question? Do you think that the people in those positions have the people's best interest at heart? Some of the politicians, no, do Thank not. You. But the judges, however, I volunteered with on two different law firms this summer. One defense that. attorney, one another um, non for profit trying to get people the the um, What about the judge who was accepting serve? money to cut and um, there are those politicians, but let me tell you put little black there boys are social, in jail. people he in got, social justice he got and lawyers and judges that are doing we, their we, damn best to change the system. The judge is expecting bribes to so convict black boys. So I don't think boys. that you can change everyone is all. Do you know that they're the same system? Do you know that there are judges who have been paid to? Oh, I don't know if I can go with you. Damn you. Just because I got other people holding their hands up to go ahead. Let her say her statement. Go ahead. Let her say her statement. We must respect the structure of the conversation. It's all right. It's all right. Um, I just want to say to you specifically, like, walking away right now, like, I, you came back, that's great, but you can walk away from this conversation and not have to think about it anymore. Well, that is white it. privilege. That is white supremacy. That is, you can just go away and this will never affect you ever again. But no one up here can do that. And I think that's what people are trying to get you to understand. Yeah, we don't have nothing. They can't ignore it because this is the reality of every single fucking day. There's Bella's a terrorist, there's Bella's a racist, and they're all in there, and they're going crazy. I'm a racist idiot. 
according to people who watch the stream. You know what I ain't watch the stream. I can tell you my body language. People are making comments. Oh, shut the fuck up, fellow. Judge is being paid. Look at the guy. You're not paying attention to people. You was in this week. You're finding right here. You're not paying attention and focused a little bit more on the conversation and dialogue than you have. Because you're looking at me now, but you're trying. You're not paying attention to me. Now you're paying attention to me, but you weren't focused exactly on what I was saying. Yeah. Because it's. It's a way that you see things, and you want to say stuff, and you want to move, and and feel like you're you're involved, but you're not, because all you're really doing is you, you're looking for something so you can pick out to say, I knew it, I knew it, I knew the niggas was gonna do so, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> I knew that shit. Like, that's, it looked like the, yeah, see you smile. Don't don't be yourself, man. It got me like yourself. You it's okay. To, like I don't even breathe you can't, with the racist stuff. You can't hide so. what's real. Like you can't hide. I, and I just want you to be real with yourself because when you're real with yourself, other people around you will not Somebody have to told you write a book. Because stuff like being at a at a golf a golf resort where you could just Kids shoot it around and talk bullshit and not be real friends with people that you actually are talking with, you're not going home with those people or in the same neighborhood you saying, Hey, man, I I I know your I struggle or this is how I feel. No, you're just going out yeah, sure. and, and Acting like you, you're a real pacifying like is the word friend. you're looking for. Pacifying. You're, you're, you're all plastics out there, man. Plastic. Y'all being fake. You know what I'm saying? There's no reason to be fake. Because this is the real world. The reason why this stuff is hitting like this is because people keep putting it behind them. And they keep acting like it ain't happening. Man, this shit is real life, man. This shit is real. You know what I'm saying? You like you're like, I, I hear you. But come on, feel me. That's what I want you to do. I want you to hear me. I want you to feel me. We're dying. You know what I'm saying? Because you have no empathy right here. You do not empathize, empathize on this situation because you're like because like what you said, your I can I interview you about white people will never be able to understand what black people You can understand. Right. So why well hold on, can I ask you why? Why? Why not? In your opinion, why not? Do you have well, hold on, well, hold on. How much do you try to? Kimberly Bowman, I can't see the end of your comment, but you seem to, and that that it drops off. You have to make a short for me to read that. How often do you try to? Hmm? Never. I got a couple hundred watching. So Almost 300 people have been watching all night. They like, they love these conversations. Doing that I love these conversations. So you can't say you you're, you can't try to when you're doing it right now. Walking away would have been not trying to. Coming back, that's trying. That's and we appreciate it. And I appreciate it. That's, this is all it takes. Because you being informed will inform the next person. Oh, and inform the next person. It is a domino effect. When you walk away, that domino is missing, everything falls. We are all connected. You would not have those warm clothes on if somebody did not make those. And you would not be able to buy them if somebody did not have the money to buy them. So everything's connected. Like this school, you wouldn't have this. You gotta ask Courtney Mask if she, she's if it wasn't the, uh, somebody that had built this establishment however long ago. Off our back. She does that. You know what I mean? This all, all of us are connected. You can't just take your isolated situation and think that you are not a part of a bigger thing that's going on. Because if you think you solo by yourself are not affecting other people in this big world, you are highly mistaken. That's why this world continues to fall into the same problems we do. Because we out want to isolate and feel like we are not in the back, connected to the next head. person, connected next to it. You know, I know you know about laws of separation. We are all connected. Come on. But the reason I was walking away is because, because it's, she was being outright racist. Black people can't even be racist. I was being prejudiced, no, no, maybe. No. She was being prejudiced. <laughs> I agree with that. I was being prejudiced. I do apologize for interrupting you speaking, though. I was supposed to respect the, the structure of the conversation, and I did not. So I do apologize for that. Can you apologize to her for calling her racist? She is. No. I said I was prejudiced, but black people cannot be racist. We can be prejudiced. But what what do me being anything, like how do I affect anything? Oh, yeah, go, go, bro. Go for it. I, I'm not exactly sure who the, the theorist is behind behind the idea that blacks can't be racist, but racism is tied to uh, this this privilege, the white privilege that we've been talking about, or just privilege in in, in general in terms of pointing at racism, it is indirectly white white privilege. So in order to be to be right and for black blacks um, prejudice doesn't impact the same punch as racism in the form of white privilege is basically what it comes down to and it's probably simple. you understand it like, because because of the, the deeply rooted 
aspect of white privilege and history and the and the things that people of color have been marginalized to experience for so long even even if we feel a distinct a, 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 somebody of color feels a sincere hate and towards a white person it will never be the same and it will never have the same effect on you as as, as, a, as when a white person demonstrates and does does the same things to somebody of color. i'm a woman and i'm black i'm nowhere near a position of power to be racist mm-hmm. uh, yeah okay prejudice i wasn't politically correct all i'm saying I'm, no, I'm, no, we try to fit into the because here, check this out. Every every student cannot be taught the same way. So sometimes right. for a person that cannot understand the the blunt, hey, dog, we you got to get your ass out here and do, get in these streets. Sasha, do I dislike white people? No. Okay, okay thank you. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I can't just be that bold to everybody because everybody. I have more than a handful of white friends, you guys. So sometimes you have to be politically correct. <laughs> Red er, got to be proper. Understand? You know what I mean? That it's, it's a lesson. It's I a, felt offended. What? From what you said. I okay. I'm not different. going to take Do you, that from a, a white man. She That's said, exactly what I meant. So yes. we moved on. Oh no, I, I apologize for not respecting so, the structure so of the conversation. I did not respond. I apologize for so, that. Let's make said, it clear. And, he, and I don't know if you focused since she was focused on that statement. I don't know if you focused on the guy she was talking to. He said, "Okay." Oh, she said, "I'm not gonna." Did you, Did you know who she was talking to? Yeah. Did you see him say it's okay after she apologized? No, because I was watching. Oh, well, so she, she, she was just dressing. Dressing. Right, that was, see, thank you. Man, come on, that's being real. Being real is, man, it's like, what's up with everybody's not being real, man? You could be real and, and be admissive to what's, what, be accountable to what's going on. That's what it's about, people being accountable. You know, I understand that you might not necessarily know how you can, uh, these situations, because you said, I, I don't know them, I don't know them but you can be accountable to acknowledging the fact that they are present. Mm-hmm. That is a step that you don't even have to have to do anything but yourself. You'll need us around to acknowledge the fact that that's present. You know what I mean? That's that's what it's about. And, and it looked like you had some on your turn that you was going to say. I'm just sorry. As okay, a black woman you, in I'm America, I have a problem with my men telling me shit. Let me know sorry. I don't know, but I'm not sorry. I mean, you've been listening. You've been, you know, you've been hearing me. I'm sorry that I'm not sorry. No, I'm not. That's what that means, that I'm not. You just didn't say folk. That's what it was. You didn't say folk. You probably didn't say folk. I just, that's all I was saying. I'm just speaking for myself. You said your body. I just wanted to. Yeah, you want to say something? He said black Irish can't be racist, neither. Don't you, it's not like against the folk. What we're doing, we're trying to, like, signify. Uh, you know, of what happened and how the execution was. It, it's not we're offending the police. It's not actually like towards the police. It's mostly trying to say like these were his last words. Yeah, it's more symbolic. It's a symbol. It's and, not, and you're looking at the you, you said the execution of was Mike, Mike Brown. Mike Brown. Okay. Who said, I don't know about his case, but well, the police officer said he ended up. He said oh, don't, don't shoot, shoot, and then he shot him in his head two times. Okay. And, okay. Exactly. and I know a lot of that's based off eyewitness. It's forensics. It's a lot of things that we don't need to get into. But I think that it is directed towards police. So can you explain to me like how? Okay, you because feel like direct because I don't because know. in like the Mike Brown situation, it was a police officer, and you're right. saying hands up, don't shoot directing it at police officers. So by saying, don't shoot me, I'm not doing anything. It's like, you're telling these police officers that even if I wasn't doing anything, you were gonna shoot me anyways. Yeah. Not really. Yeah. And, pe- and it, they're, not all police officers are like that. When Mike Brown was executed, his hands were up and he said, his hands were up. So we were saying like, And this is according to Iron account? Several. Yeah. Okay. It, was, it was several people that saw the shooting. He said, basically, we're saying his hands were up and he said don't shoot to the officer and we we're basically symbolically showing what that means we're right I understand in words that. we can't really you know right, hands right. Up. we just can't be like don't you know we can't say don't shoot uh, i guess like, i just, I, just I, I understand what you're representing but i guess i have yeah. a problem with it problem. No, 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 no. because I know some police officers personally. So do I. Work I do too. Home. I do too. I, I, I related to I a know, couple. I have a police officer in my family. What? No, no. Oh, I know some black people. Oh, and I don't. 
Okay. Because <laughs> you like is that a representative? I I She's like, yep. I'm not trying to offend anyone. Said, okay, I actually well, agree I with like what's people. going on here. <laughs> I, there does need to be a change in the system. Like, I've seen it with my own eyes. I've interned downtown with law firms. I'm just saying, as someone who I just don't think it's appropriate, but we can agree to disagree. Can I say this really Hold on. Hold on. Can I? Okay. I, I don't mean to offend you, but these people are not trying to oppress anyone. And, they're, and if, if they are directing a finger towards the police, I want to ask you why the policemen are directing their fingers towards them. So, all the policemen? No, no, no. When I, I say it all, but he's all the police. They could come join and march with us. I guess, never uproar. I guess it was in response to what he, someone had said about, well, we're doing it because it's like the oppression on you guys, so you can understand. And I just don't agree with that form of understanding. No, so someone did like say that. that and Somebody okay, said I mean, that, but I want to take but it back. Are you just, okay. What okay. I want to say is, we're not trying to say it like that. What okay. we're saying is this conversation right here is making a change right now. Yeah. We want white folks to not have anything to do with race. Let's just take the blindfold off yeah. right now. And say yes, we don't get targeted. If we get pulled over, if we do have a warrant, most oh, likely we're not that. going to jail. We yeah. want you guys to realize there is a difference. For us to be here, we are making a change right now, so we don't want to make this into a debate or an argument. We want to say we want you guys to spread the word. You do have it right. easier. You can get to different people. Yeah. Spread the word. Change people's minds. That's what this conversation is yeah. about. To stop saying, oh, he's white or black. You're looking at my skin no. color, not who yeah, I am. Yeah, exactly. Not saying I, I agree completely you with or that. black people. I, I and I agree with this movement. The system does need to be changed 100%. I am with you. I am on that. I understand the white privilege and the police officer and that those happenings. It was just I find that I just I personally find that slogan offensive. But that's a very very small part of this entire dialogue. Right, it's bigger than. But, but with, with the bigger part of the dialogue, I completely agree with the bigger overarching okay. part right, of this dialogue. Right. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to have everybody that's at SLU start spreading the word whether everyone can make flyers whatever to start having people occupy or have people come out to the conversations every night so we can bring the whole slew out here eventually or attempt to and then we can bring forest park and all of them and have them occupying there that's the bigger picture you know some people are doing um lawyer things some people are in the Whatever, whatever you're into, you guys can bring that knowledge here mm -hmm. and spread it out to everyone. And somebody may know how to write a letter good, and we can send it to the president. Somebody may know how to do petitions. We can get the people mm -hmm. out there. You know, that's the point of us bringing it here okay. so yeah. that the universities can start getting involved. Yeah. So that's, that's where no, the conversation needs to start I completely agree with that. And then actually, that actually answered another question I've had, which is... Man, when we got a group over there, y'all speak I'm, to the I'm like that. It's like, what is the call to action? But you've answered that, and like... I'm 100% with that now, and I see how a little part we agree to disagree on, but in the bigger picture, we agree. Right, which is what the I think overall goal that's going to yeah. make the movement and change the system is us coming together as one right. and figuring out a solution, which is passing <laughs> each other's knowledge and resources so we can get the overall picture yeah. down, which is changing laws, getting the recall and all that. Also, let me see that. We got a whole group over it's, here. We got a whole group over hey, here. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We do have some yeah, we'll back Like up. we can have a break off personal conversation, but the whole group uh, is that there Oh, she talked to me. me. She talked no, she, she. Uh, um, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to offend you, but I know you said you know policemen who aren't like the other ones. Why aren't they here? I mean, is it because they're policemen? Because they're back home in Iowa. Why why can't the policemen here be here? Well, why the good why ones that you talk about, I guess is what she if might they, say. If they don't support Just if they're here. what's happening, why can't they be here? Like physically here or in the movement? It's in the movement. I don't see them saying anything. I see policemen strolling around and looking at these people it's like the they're doing something. The Why can't they come and say, I support you? And she don't mean I, just the ones you know. She no, like, I know. Yeah. On their own time, they definitely can. But well, I'm not going to get into this. But when it comes to being on the clock on the job, I want them out being police i don't want them here if that makes sense right but on their own time they're individuals and they can say whatever they want how and do you I police agree. a community if you don't know the community mm -hmm. i mean but most importantly the reason they can't be here is because they're also part of a brotherhood right, so right. The biggest gang the in the nation. Right. we need a That's gang injunction against the fucking police because, I, mean, here, I don't know, know how many times police. i gotta say that their ass is on the line plain and simple to be here so they would rather collect a check because 
Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And they also spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to tell us to stay on the sidewalk with a very non-offensive, or excuse me, non-violent, don't shoot, like hands in the air. Hundreds of thousands. Oh. Six million in two weeks. In two weeks. To tell people to stay on the sidewalk. To stay on the sidewalk and to get out of the streets and to not march and to quiet down. That's what they do. It's a system of them. Hold on, you. Let the young lady speak over there, y'all. No, we don't. We just know that the eyewitnesses who had absolutely nothing to do with Mike Brown, who were construction workers, were like, hey, his hands were up. But no, we don't know shit. We're just going to blindly trust the police because they never lie. I'm speaking to the, there's like hundreds of people commenting. Yeah. I want to express in a healthy way that I'm kind of offended that you took offense to um, that particular slogan because that slogan is reality. Because there was a young man um, in New York and he was actually shot with handcuffs on and he's not the first one to die with handcuffs on. The reality of that slogan is black men are dying in submission. Meanwhile, there are some white men that they are apprehended alive by police officers. They, they could wave, I've seen white men wave guns at police officers and they still have been apprehended alive. So I am very sorry if you feel like the phrase is attacking police officers, but that's not the intention behind it. The, the intention behind it is to express the fact that in submission and surrender and handcuffs these black men are still being shot there are black men that have died with 42 bullets in their bodies it's, it's like that out here and that's the purpose behind the slogan and the physical I'm evidence shows he was shot in his fucking kinda, head and he didn't have a weapon kinda, i don't know it just kind of bothered me that you that you're offended by that because that is a reality we're offended by the fact that that is a reality for us and that's all i had to say good 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 um good job sir um, before I lose my train of thought from getting beat up by the police and correctional officers, I gotta say what I gotta say. Um, thanks for probably. Here's a photo of Chief Dotson with me. I got photos, you can pass this around. I got photos with Chief Bimmerman. You talk about Jennifer Joyce, the head prosecuting attorney of St. Louis City. You wanna talk about Bob McCulley. You wanna talk about the prosecuting um the what you got the aldermans everybody who's in the politic business i seen all them i seen all them in action i know what they do i see you call me a paralegal but you better not choose me because i don't know what i don't know what to do but i've been in that bitch she's talking about the police doing this and the police doing that not only her but other people as well looking at different sides of the view of officers I got some officer friends, but they don't participate in no bullshit. All they look at is for the youth, the 13 year olds that are fighting, but now picking up guns, killing each other. That's what they looking at, my police partner. Now, the Chief Dotson I know, and the Chief Bemerin I know, talk about Chief Dotson. And the Chief Dotson I know talk about Chief Bemerin. They all talk about each other, but they all work with each other. And, and they all talk that. behind each other back. Even with the prosecuting attorney, even with the state, the people who control with the laws, even, we're not saying white, we're not saying black. We just saying if you up under their employment and they paying you, you gonna do whatever they say. You gonna be what they say in, in roots. You a porch monkey. They, we have those. I'm a victim of those. In the workhouse MSI, I got jumped by black people that are police officers that have some badge. And where's my justice at? Where's the young men justice that are Michael still Warren, locked like, up? Uh -huh. Where is that? So when y'all start talking about police, y'all start talking about lawyers, y'all start talking about prosecuting attorney, don't none of y'all, and I'm standing on it, know more about it than me because I be with these people. I know how these people work. My salary is gonna be forty thousand dollars. You know what I did? I said fuck them. I said fuck them. When I was out there for the Michael Brown thing, I lost my job. You know why? Cause I said fuck them. Because they not gonna keep killing my young brother. Thank I don't care you. about them killing me, but I don't want them to kill what's up under me, which right. is my child. My child, exactly. The generation that Thank is going you. on. Now y'all going to school. And after all this stuff is gone out of y'all sight, what are y'all gonna do? Is y'all still gonna be in the community? No. 
Y'all, y'all not gonna be walking on Grand, walking down um Street, walking down Natural Bridge. Why? Because y'all stereotype. Y'all say, oh, we walk down there, uh, they gonna whoop our ass. The police gonna think we selling drugs. Well, let them do that shit. Let us be the ones that choose what what goes on. Stop letting shit make your life. That's what y'all doing. Let something make y'all life, bro. I ain't got nothing. I volunteered for five years, bro. Five years and I was trying to get a job. And I ain't got shit, but I still was working. That's how I know about all these damn politicians. All about these fucking police, bro. Y'all talking about police? I'm talking about chiefs. I'm talking about the head prosecuting attorneys, bro. Y'all can go look it up. MSI, workhouse, gladiator fight. COs jumping inmates. Where's the justice at? All that shit got covered up, but you know what? I'm gonna bring that shit back out because they got me fucked up. I was locked up, now I'm back out, bro. Is y'all gonna help me with that? Is y'all gonna go walk down there on um, Paul's Ferry with me? Is y'all? Is y'all, is y'all supporting? I'm asking y'all a question. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just like this. Should humans be fucking shot to death? because they bought a sandwich, because they had their hands in the air, like remove the skin color from that and tell me if they should have been shot. Uh, I have, I guess, one question. Uh, is there any need to use language like that? I mean, I, I don't know what I, I think that part of the way that people perceive you is with the language that you use. And coming up here and getting in a, I'm not just directing this at you, but I've heard it a couple times, there's no need to use the F word. There's no, there's just no no need for, for language like that in this conversation. Um, I have not been, um, Why? Yes. Why? Uh, can I just respond to that? I mean, like, uh, 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 I'm asking permission. Yeah, literally. Yeah, go ahead. I, I can be done. That's I, not a problem. No, no, no. no, when no, no, I, no, 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 no. I want to finish it. I want you to finish your question. Let him touch on this question and then you can finish your statement. Okay. You know, a lot of people hear me drop the F on him and everything. Um, I was a top speaker in open parliamentary debate for the state of California for two years running. Um, I can speak very eloquently. I can definitely switch coats if need be. However, like when we talk about this, you have to understand that we are talking about people who when we go to their their schools, like the textbook my little sister has is the same one that I had and I'm 31 and she's she's 10 years younger than me. So like we are not effectively being educated enough to be able to express ourselves in the way that would necessarily make people who are our white or Hispanic or whatever counterparts feel necessarily comfortable. I even have a poem about it. It's like sometimes you got to pay attention to the reason why I'm so mad instead of the language that I'm using. And so I do understand that it may make people feel uncomfortable, but our entire life is uncomfortable. So it's not that like we're trying to, you know, um, destroy your lives or, you know, anything like that. But it's like you kind of got to sometimes just accept people's message the way it is and find the root of the of what's going on. Because we can't always find something less less. We can't even always find something that that will adequately describe how we feel. Sometimes all I know what to say is fuck. You know what I mean? Like this shit is fucked up. And I'm like, like I said, I have a rather extensive vocabulary. I am highly educated, but that doesn't mean that I don't still speak the, the, the layman's terms. You know what I mean? Like when I go into the ghetto where a lot of people maybe having home owned homes in two generations or many people just consider it a, an achievement to graduate from high school, let alone thinking about a JC or a four year, they're not at, uh, always able to express themselves. So we sometimes got to step outside and say, okay, this ain't no angry black woman. You know what I mean? Or this ain't no, no fucking and crazy nigger no shit like that this is somebody who is very passionate very upset very jaded and needs somebody to just open their minds and understand them and where they're coming from like and sometimes you don't even got to understand me just recognize that i'm a human and i'm i'm missing out on basics food water shelter love community you know what i mean yeah, because of who i am so we can't say we on the street where can we say you know it, what i mean so it's like it, you know it, i mean just from my perspective like i said i can't speak for everybody but it's something that i have come to terms with you know what i mean when i when i go talk to my friends like when i leave school from my debate practice you know speech forensics and is a thing and then i go over to to the six nine bill in east oakland like i'm not about to sit over there and talk to them like i was talking to my debate people like no i you know like She's not going to understand when I'm talking about mutual exclusivity all the time or when I'm talking about, you know, the attitudinal inherency or, you know, these types of things. Exactly. Like these large 50 cent wires, like they're not always going to understand them. And I don't mean to call my people ignorant. That's not what I'm saying. It's just that the institutionalized education where we regurgitate things and that's how we say that that's how we're intelligent and we recognize that needs to be kicked to the side. You know what I mean? So, I mean, people are going to say shit. 
I say shit, I come out and I do things, but the point, the the, the root of the problem is really what we need to pay attention to. So Throughout that's the whole my conversation, piece. conversation, he sounded really intelligent. In fact, he wasn't cursing at all, but as he started talking about a traumatic experience, such as being jumped, he started cursing. What? I wonder what, how I would sound if I was jumped by multiple people and I was relaying that to about 30 people out here. That is a, Just man, saying, come on. When, when, you're, when you're in a conversation with someone else, right. I think that I, I've always been taught from what I, and I assume that this is kind of one of those, you know, you, know, you treat privilege. other people's, you treat other people the way you want to be treated. And come with that, you respect people the way that you respect someone, you hope that they would respect you in return. And I think that part of that is if you are going to talk at someone like that, then you should expect to be treated the same way in return. And that, that's all I'm saying is that when you use language like that, that's just, I, I look at it when you're directing it at someone that... It's not just, a, I, I swear when I talk with my friends, that it's a whole completely different thing. But when you're, when you're having a conversation, especially with some an authority figure, and you use language like that, it's not necessary. <laughs> I, I do want to say one thing. Uh, that you, you it seemed the, like, hold on, hold on. Who's authority, you go, there? Who's authority One thing I did want to say, like when, whenever it's a situation, okay, let's say uh, some uh, someone died in a family. You have family members come together. Sometimes when they talk, they're not just politically correct. I understand. So, and this situation is a bunch of that. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of funerals, a bunch of deaths, a bunch of losses, and people are highly emotional. And when they talk, you, and when you're emotional, you tend to not use the same word you would if you weren't. So you have to take that into consideration before you, when you jump into a conversation. Yeah. This is an emotional and, and a highly sensitive situation, period. So when you jump in, just know as well. it's gonna be some fuck shit stands all in there. <laughs> fuck shit but, damn. <laughs> but at the same time, you're going to come out with some substance. And I, I just trying to really quickly, it's important not to put the burden of communication on the person you're listening to. Put the burden of communication on yourself, and because it's a little bit dangerous. Because if you're not hearing a very important message because you don't agree with the delivery then you could be shutting yourself out from some serious message. And we're talking about Mike Brown and human life. You could get as, for me, you could get as angry as you want to be because I'm understanding there's a dead person over there. And even if I might not have said it the same way, push that aside, put it, take ownership of it and make the burden of communication on you. Pull the message out. Yeah, and you, and, I, I just kind of have a couple of singular yeah, yeah, yeah. thoughts. So, oh yeah, I guess either way. And also, I, I guess you have to consider that when you're saying like they're talking at that to you, they're not calling you a motherfucker. Like if somebody is saying the word fuck where they're telling a story, they're not like, I was fucking jumped. They're not call, saying that to me. They're talking about the situation. They're not cursing at you necessarily. <laughs> See but as opposed to like what's going on, I guess. Right. Any other thoughts yeah, on that? Garden of Fruit is on government, um, I understand. My next See question that. is that, okay, when you're talking about police brutality, is that directed at all police officers that abuse power, or is it just white? I'm, all I'm just police. Looking all police. police. Okay, if that's, then I'm... I just said black that, home yeah. at the workhouse. Yes, police <laughs> that abuse their power, anyone that abuses their power, there should be justice for them. Yep. I, Let's just say I, that black police that. who abuse their power in black communities is even more egregious. Yeah, yes. that's that's hard. That's really hard, bro, for your own people to even treat you just like you already see the other officers treating you, bro. That shit hard. Yes. I, 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 just, I wanted a clarification on that because, yes, if, if any any time that you abuse power, there, there should be there should be a punishment for consequence. it. Consequence. There should be a consequence for it. Right. Now, I am I am from Ohio. I'm not from around here. Ohio. So, how do you feel about John Crawford? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, in in the <laughs> like, oh, look down. the timeline of, of the, uh, I'll start with the Mike Brown okay. shooting. Oh yeah. Um, is it still said that, uh, or at least from eyewitnesses, that he was walking away? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes. the last, the last, last okay. thing we got was from the um, two construction workers. They have not recanted their okay. eyewitness testimony. Okay. Um, then I'm sure that you probably saw the coroner's report that came out after that. Yeah. Then you wouldn't see the coroner's yeah. report. Yeah. And that the bullets entered from the front of them. Yeah. yeah. Why do you have to run away from? The Hold front on, don't look down here. One of the bullets entered through the front of the arm here. 
And that could have been from two things. His hands could have been in the air. He could have been facing the cop. I guess three things. And when you're walking away, this part of your arm is actually facing backwards. So he could have been shot in the back. You just don't know. Okay, well, that so that, that is one bullet, one but I know that I don't remember what the other was. the other five Here. were entered Which, from. Yeah. And then with his hands up. And it doesn't take away from the fact that he could have been shot at while he was walking away. He just might not have been. Hit. Law okay. enforcement actually said that he was shot at as he ran away. They admitted that. They there were shots fired as he was running. Away. Okay. Um. So I know that during you know it's it's all about the. Um, I know some people have said, okay, you aren't supposed to, you know, don't believe the media, don't believe. Then, if, if I'm not supposed to believe them... <laughs> Will not curse and stop you from being killed on the street. What no, if you can't believe him, you that, don't finish that, that I'm supposed to, to believe you. you. I, I'm, I'm Six witnesses. At, okay, I'm looking at that there's evidence. This summer, I, I was called for jury duty. Right. I still don't know how I, being a 19-year-old, I have tons of... Uh, my parents, uh, tons of people that I know man. that have never been called for jury duty. I haven't even been able to vote yet. I wasn't old enough when I voted, when I could have voted. So I got called for jury duty. And I know that the conviction that we, and we found this woman guilty of, it was, um, it doesn't really matter, but, uh, Wait. we found her guilty based on the evidence. Right. So if I had gone and jumped to a conclusion before we had gone through the process, then that would not have been fair to her. And and I realize that this is a very, very heated, heated topic, but I would think that we need to make sure that all the evidence is forth before we go and make a declaration on one side look, of the other. I mean, but don't they have three cases so because the police like not falsify reports event. and plant evidence? There have been, like, there have been numerous events that the media has blown out of proportion before the evidence has come forth. Now, now can I ask you a question? Yes. Now, what happens if someone planted something on you? Okay, then that's, that's a completely other issue. Because check this out. I think you have my pen. That's free case. Now, that's, if they call them free they, cases out here in Oakland, California. We have the Oakland Riders. They have to pay out millions in misconduct lawsuits. We now, actually still have some officers who were named as Oakland Riders who are still employed and actually called me out by name because I was filming the Occupy Oakland protest because he was riding by my riding by me. So that's how much we feel like the need to make our citizens feel protected. A lot of people saw what happened to Mike Brown with their own eyes. They saw what happened. And as far as people who weren't there and who didn't maybe talk to people who saw what happened, there are, what, eight people who all basically say the same thing happened. So, yes, I'm going to lean more towards the story that eight people tell versus the story that the police tell. To protect with, uh, our Netta, who are obviously going to protect the officer. Where are you from? See right here, these two, these where am I from? Yeah. This is right here. California. They'll let you know. Always oh, California. This idea that we yeah. can't, that we can't come to a prejudged situation is false, man. I mean, if we're giving information, we can say, all right, so far from what we have, it seems that this is the case. I mean, you can have your own conclusion, I can have my conclusion, but to say I can't make a judgment and tell people about what I think has happened so far is wrong. And, and then again, none of us are on the grand jury. So none of our opinions necessarily matter right now. But right. we're out here going against police brutality and to stomp the streets and get people out here to realize what we're fighting about. Okay, so, I mean, and just say the militarization of our police departments is not a problem, it's just to be in denial. Can I say one more thing? Uh, I also want to say something about police abusing their power because uh, a lot of police... Because a, a lot of, uh, so yeah, a lot of, some police abuse their power, but a lot of the problem with policing and over-policing of black communities is not about abuse of power. People are working within the system that allows them to discriminate against people of color. I mean, it's a, it, it's accepted, it's allowed, it's, it's legal. So it's not just about abuse of power, it's about the system of policing that is discriminatory and, uh, and racist, quite, quite frankly. So this, you know, just recognize that it's not really just about a few bad cops. It's about the system and the people who operate within the system and the people who, when somebody does something bad, cover up for that person or support them, even if they may not do those things themselves. Now I like the idea that we should be quiet because other people may not be able to think critically and make their own decisions. Yeah, I'm not going to 
quiet my voice for these maybe grand jury members who don't necessarily can think are strong enough fingers to come to a conclusion based on the evidence. Okay. Now, if you were the one that was on trial, if you were the one, were would the one that was in jail on trial, right now. Exactly. <laughs> he would be in jail <laughs> with the uh, unconstitutional bail. Already dead. Would you bail. want people to make a prejudged decision upon it's you? It's my right to make a prejudged decision. I don't give a damn what you think, because First Amendment. I can if think. I was not even. I can think what I want to think. Are you telling me I can't have a thought? No, 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 I'm not saying that at all. That, that is exactly what you were saying. No, all right. no, no he said that's not what he said, so oh, let him sorry, say what he's saying. Please clear. Go ahead. Sorry. No, Go ahead. I apologize. He said that's not what he said, but you said say what you were saying. If you were on trial, you were, I, I know they, they said this at the beginning, you know, you have to fill out the giant questionnaire about any prejudices that you may have or you may know so-and-so person that could somehow influence this. They want to make sure that you have no connection to this trial whatsoever. Okay, so you're supposed to come in, come into it with an open mind. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Have an open mind. Well, the grand jury's been tainted. Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let them finish. Let them finish. I, like I said, I, I'm not. How, how has the grand jury? Uh, there was actually an investigation because a woman put on Twitter that there's not enough evidence for an indictment and that she has a friend on the grand jury. They've been discussing it and there's been an investigation launched into that. It happened uh, around the 8th of this month. Okay, well, that, so, is, that is illegal. I, yeah. I was not allowed to discuss anything with any of my family members whatsoever during it. So, yes, that that is correct. Something... That is not right, and that person should not be on what the trial. But there's the still laws that you that you believe in and uphold. Break this down to you have laws. It's about what? I mean, we're like dealing with that, right? Oh, okay. Surrounding the facts of Mike Brown case in St. Louis or Ferguson who aren't legitimized protests. We protection. move the trial somewhere else. These are the same laws that you are trying to tell us are perfect, but you're trying to tell us right now they're I'm, not I'm perfect. I'm not saying these are perfect. I, I, I oh, have not so, said that once. What's your so dilemma? we shouldn't be upset with what? that. What? Well, what's, what's your dilemma? dilemma? No, I just want to know what your dilemma is. They were just telling us what, uh, about different viewpoints on how he saw how he saw things with the court system and how it was on being uh, Um, I'm going to have to whip it around again, but thank <laughs> you. Yeah. Exactly. Well, he... Freak y'all ever oh, watch yeah, my live stream? No, that, 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 he's basically, <laughs> he does, and, and kind of, the only thing is, it, it's already, put it like this, to be in the, to, to be on the, on the case for, for a court case, you have to have fall on certain criteria, right? Now, already, can you, can you have a felony and do that? No, no. no. Now, my myself, I, I know that because I have a felony. I can actually vote, and, and I can't do that. But it's it's ironic that the a lot of people that I know that have felonies look like me, and they can't get into the cases to be able to stand up and look at the evidence to even say something about it to to have the the right say so and the right answer. Now, most of the time, if you look at it like the cases. The judges and the jury don't look anything like the defendant, you know? Lack of representation. It, 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 was, it, was it was a black woman that was on trial, and we had an African-American judge. So okay, how many people were on your jury that looked like her? There were 12 people on our jury, how many like and I honestly do not recall. That I means it wasn't that many. That means it wasn't that many. called down a week before, you remember. and there had been a, a handful that had been called None of them were seated, and most of them were seated. realize it's always somebody who completely derails the productive conversation that was happening here. The whole, the whole if, if you don't mind, I, can I yeah, yeah, ask I'm another a, question? Yeah, yeah. How many? Yeah. How many? So, um, <laughs> <laughs> this particular protest yes. has this been? Was what was the exact event that spurred this on? Was it the shooting the other day in Shaw? Um, the the shooting. In Mike Mike Brown's case, sparked yeah, a I, conversation. Yeah, I realized that that right? sparked this whole thing. It sparked, no, not the whole thing. It sparked the opening of a new conversation. Yes. And so people had to focus on Mike Brown to have an open dialogue. Artil to uh, 
articulate that that uh, conversation a little bit more. Then there were two more murders within a month time span, which really opened the door to the conversation that we were trying to have in, in the first place. Because um, it's not just um, it's not just the one on Mike Brown or the one on Shaw. Because it was Gene no, Pyle too that happened right now. It's not even a St. Louis and thing. Right, it's it happens a, all a, over. A, Alan Bluford, Oscar Grant, from Oakland, California. We're not even talking about Ezel Ford from L.A. You know what I mean? Like, we're not even exactly. talking about the young man who was shot in San Francisco um, by San Francisco police who was from Oakland or the man who was shot in Oakland on the night of the 8th that I got back. Like, this is an epidemic. And it's the, like after a while, you're going to have young black youth come out and say, we're so tired of this shit. We don't even care. We don't give a fuck about Ebola, environment yeah, or like, nothing. Like, like it's time so, to pay attention. So, so like if police brutality exists, that doesn't exist. So, to answer your question, uh, we've seen video. We, there's conviction. The significance on it. Of, of something like this and why we're here is because. Um, <laughs> Darren Wilson is still free. That's what sparked it. I look at Slew, it's kind of like a, a mini version of America, right? And. Uh, you guys have the protocol I'm here. I'm live streaming in my stream. We kind of came here. And people need to know. Broke those codes, right? Broke a lot of codes. My, my viewers like, like it because I'm not afraid to like say their comments. Yeah, and we're ask still getting things done for our okay, effort, and actually, in the process, we're actually changing the culture of your school. You stream? There's a lot of people here. Who are, mm -hmm. There's seniors here that never felt comfortable. Yeah, like there's a video, but then I can hit the chat and then come up and I can follow. Because of this dialogue, but you know what? I filmed the Occupy Open. What we've done was go outside of the structure to do that and things are being accomplished so in the large scheme of that if you look at slew as america in america isn't here now the subject uh these protests need to be based outside of the the regular structure of what we're trying to do a lot of protests protests we've seen in, in the past are based around legislation and, and all of that but we're saying there's a problem with the entire structure that america has you know what i'm saying that it's a pyramid structure capitalism all these things and everybody's supposed to be striving to get to the top as if there is room for all of us, but there's not room for all of us at that time. We know that, and people are are uh, benefiting from this structure more than other people are. I mean, it's a sign of the time. That's, that's why I keep talking about the fact that they're benefiting from it. We're never going to be able to. They don't have to really acknowledge the people who aren't benefiting from it. And it's not a the, the only way that they can that things can be equal to me personally is to uh, do things outside of the structure including uh, having our targets not just be legislation and these other things we need to think more broader than that. and that's the significance of, of us being here because people can model what we're doing at SLU which some might think is minute compared to the whole problem but it's really not if you kind of look at the plan and the structure behind it. I, I have a couple, one comment on something that she had said in a uh, bigger question on, on what you had said. Um, so you had listed, she had listed a couple different people that um, I am not familiar with all of those names. I mean, like the that. Um, but I'm assuming that they were guessing African Americans. And For sure. Yes. Um, so are you also um, protesting, protesting about the death of Dylan Taylor last month that you talked? Who? 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 I've never been to him. I'm like, as far as I'm willing to go. No, I'm terrified, actually. This is as far as I'm willing to go. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm, I'm fucking terrified. Like, I'm afraid. Like, I will not go to the South. And it's, you know, and that's sad, though. You know what I mean? Like, I should care. It's not. 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 It's I'm kind of so done with this, y'all. Y'all still want to watch this? To him just one Please ago. tell me. You, you preface by saying you have to admit and you apologize for not knowing all of those names. There was there was name. You named one person. Okay, that's so isolated. If you look at at history, since the since the inception of this country, black people have been marginalized and killed, and there have been excuses for their deaths since we've started, since we've been in this country from the beginning. So mm -hmm. this one white kid that got killed by a black officer, that is it's tragic. It absolutely is. But what we're dealing with is an epidemic and it's systematic. You know, the fact that, that what, what happened to the officer that killed the black, I mean the white kid? Is anything, is he going to trial or anything like that? 
it, I, I don't, it makes I, you feel better. That was a, no, no, but you know what? No, 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 no. We going on we, we going on seventy no, no, no. days White kid of Aaron Wilson shot being by free. Security, by, shot by uh, university days. security guard. Fucked up equally, man. Everybody out here trying to go for the same goal. In police brutality. Well, man. how about like, this? What, do you think are, the, are, the, are the people who are demanding justice for the black police officer facing millions of dollars by the local police departments to silence them and tell them to stand on the sidewalks, or does it become very violent aggression against peaceful protesters when you demand justice for a white officer shooting a black man? Like these are the questions you need to look at. That's a very small-minded way to look at that situation. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's unheard of. You know, but but the thing is, people weren't outraged because it was black people getting gas. Now, if if the National Guard came to wherever you said there was, and there was a gang of white people protesting, and they got tear gas, it would be outrage, outrage across the whole world. And the thing is, black lives doesn't matter doesn't matter as much as black as white lives to America. Point blank, period. And that's why we're here, and that's why we want to be here in doing all types of different things in this city until we get that recognition, until we get that same level of respect. The thing is, I don't need a racist person to like me. I'm not saying that you're racist, but in general, I don't need a racist person to like me, but you will respect me. I will have the same rights as you. You can't, you can't deny me my rights because of my skin color. People were getting, uh, getting arrested left and right for, for standing up for their constitutional rights. For standing still and protesting, you're getting, you're getting hemmed up and taken to jail and put in an orange jumpsuit for no reason. They don't do white people like that. Bundy. Anybody know about and Bundy? I, I the I Bundy protest? This narrative, like, what was his other question? Black it's black person was black and white. Hold on, hold on, and they're the catalyst. We, we hey, people get upset because a white person bro. died, Yo. such as in Utah, Yo, yeah. nobody said anything. Well, maybe need more people need to, like, participate than just him, because this whole conversation got derailed to educate him instead of being a productive dialogue like it was supposed to be. But that's the reality. It's not but that is the white. reality. But it is. He, Mike Brown was killed because he was black. So I'm saying. Like, I feel like this is like a so was John Carper. He was killed because he was black that we've named, in an open carry state all those, all in the those aisle black with the toys. Were killed this playing summer, with the toys. Were killed because they were black. Some of them were killed while they were in handcuffs. That does not happen to white people. In I'm the back sorry. seat of a car. It doesn't happen. The, 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 my man got choked out in New York. It was rude a homicide. And nobody has been charged. Yep. It's I'm even rude giving him a homicide. For free, but you can't give and me nobody has cigarette been cigarette charged. We get murdered for that shit. Mike Brown got killed in broad it's daylight in front of a dozen people. I got there was at least six eyewitnesses. It shouldn't even have to. You don't even need a grand jury to indict anybody for that. Six eyewitnesses is enough to go straight to an indictment. But instead, McCulloch picked a grand jury who know he knew wouldn't convict. Darren Wilson, and then instead of suggesting a, 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 a choice. All right, y'all, I got to shut down. I just got a warning. I'm about to exceed recording time. Shutting down, coming back up. Give me a couple seconds.